on the order and we Okay, good evening, and we are um, going to. Wow, Apple. This Okay, so we'll do a roll call, Mrs. Sugars, please. Mrs. Stratton? Here. I was in two Mrs. Fleischer? Here. Mrs. Gallagher? Here. Mr. Greenbaum? Here. Mr. Mayor? Here. Dr. Rude? Here. Mrs. Tong? Here. Mrs. Winters? Here. Ms. Stern? Here. Well, I have a documentary. On TV. Okay, um, so we are going to ask Dr. Mosh, do we have any board recognition tonight? Not this evening. Okay, very good. So we'll go right into our presentations. And I believe that um, Mrs. Holgram is going to present the presentation for us. So if you would uh, approach the podium and get us started. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stern. So uh, tonight with us in the room, we have Ms. Faith Holmgren uh, and also Ms. Nora Smaldor. Uh, these two folks make up our testing office in the district. Uh, so any of the standardized assessments, state testing, uh, district assessments all go through the work um, that these two individuals manage um, throughout Cherry Hill. So we're thankful for them to be here this evening to do an updated presentation. Ms. Holmgren will be delivering the presentation uh, this evening. Um, Dr. Morton, Dr. Mahan have worked with the team in preparation uh, for tonight's presentation. I believe Dr. Morton, Dr. Mahan have it pulled up and we are ready to go. And Ms. Holmgren, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks Thank for you. being here. Thank you very much, Dr. Malash. Dr. Malash took some of our thunder, so go ahead. You can just start. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you again for having me this evening. Um, and as Dr. Malash said, I also welcome with open arms my new counterpart, the new Val Sadwin, uh, Nora, uh, I am very happy to have her as part of the team in the assessment office. <clears throat> so as you are aware, tonight I will present the Start Strong Fall 2022 data results. The purpose of Start Strong is to inform classroom instruction. Teachers are expected to use this data when developing instructional plans for supporting their students. The assessment should be viewed as a formative tool that guides teachers in working with their students. Start Strong should also be used in conjunction with our locally administered assessments. When looking at the Start Strong data, there are several things the NJDOE encourages districts to consider. The first, we still need to keep in mind the impacts of the pandemic on learning. Next, districts should not compare any Start Strong data to NJSLA data due to the different design of each of these assessments. Start Strong was not designed to predict future student performance on NJSLA, nor was it designed to estimate what score a student could have received if they had taken spring 2022 NJSLA. Start Strong does, however, provide a data point to support district level curriculum planning, as well as allows for conversation between parents and educators on where their child might be and be in need of support at the very beginning of the, of the school year. So moving on to the test design of Start Strong. Start Strong is based upon a subset of prior year academic standards. So an example I can provide for you, a grade five student taking ELA Start Strong in fall of 2022 would be aligned, that assessment would be aligned to a subset of grade four New Jersey student learning standards for ELA. 
This assessment is administered in approximately 45 to 60 minutes, and the results are immediate to educators. For the Start Strong assessments, students are categorized into one of three suggested support levels, each one defined by a range of possible raw scores. The goal of these classifications is to provide guidance to teachers on the amount of support that may be needed as students return to school at the very beginning of the school year, as I said. The three levels of support are strong support may be needed, may be needed some support may be needed, or less support may be needed. As reflected in this chart on slide four, the support levels on the Start Strong assessment are directly derived from the NJSLA performance levels. However, because there are only three Start Strong support classifications, if you will, as compared to five for NJSLA, there is not one-to-one -one mapping. Now what you have been waiting for. Moving into the actual data. First, we have the ELA percentages for the district as a whole, comparing the fall 2021 results to fall 2022 results. Here you can find the same chart with percentages only with our Start Strong mathematics data, again, comparing fall 2021 to fall 2022 for the district as a whole. You will note on this side, slide, excuse me, as well as several subsequent slides that I used arrows to indicate the drop in percentages we saw in our mathematics results, specifically in the strong support needed category. For example, if you look at grade four in fall of 2021, 34% of our students were in need of strong support. However, in fall of 2022, that number decreased to only 25%. We will now move into the data for the specific schools, starting with our elementary schools. Here you will find the data for Barton. All of these slides include both the ELA, grade four, and grade five data, as well as the math grade four and grade five data. Moving on to Cooper, Hart, you can just continue through, yep. Here we have Johnson, Kilmer, Kingston. And here on night, there's something that I want to point out. I think you can begin to see a trend. And that trend is the decrease in percentage of our students in mathematics in both grades four and five who are in need of strong support. Man. followed by pain, sharp, Stockton, and finally Woodcrest. Now moving on to the middle schools. Again, please notice the decline in strong support needed at all three of our middle schools in mathematics. Beck, Carusi, and finally Rosa. Now moving on to our high schools. East, 
and west. So before uh, Mrs. Holmgren and I jump into the next slide, I wanted to reiterate that our commitment to providing students with a high quality education and our emphasis on student achievement has not wavered. Student achievement can be measured in a variety of ways, but for purposes of our presentation, we are speaking to how students perform on standardized assessments and their growth over time and how we are specifically responding to that data. We are committed to returning to levels of achievement in which Cherry Hill Public Schools, family and community are accustomed. Over the next few months, our conversations regarding achievement will begin to move away from the data and the charts that you saw and speak more to the intervention strategies and how we are responding specifically to the data. I also want to thank all members of the Cherry Hill Public School community, specifically our teachers, Research shows and tells us that the quality of the instructor is paramount in student success and achievement. Our teachers have done a tremendous job making connections with students, implementing the curriculum with fidelity, and most importantly, adapting instruction to meet our students where they are. This is evident in the scores that you saw tonight, specifically in mathematics, which is why we highlighted the decrease in the need for strong support across all of the grade spans. So two notable achievements this evening, one in ELA is the improvement for grade four to grade five had significant improvement in their achievement. And then as already indicated, the decrease in the percentage of students in mathematics across the board who may be in need of strong support in all grades, except for grade seven and in geometry. I do want to highlight that we look at the data in a variety of ways. Sometimes we are asked, are you sharing the data looking at cohorts of kids? Are you looking at growth over time? How are you interpreting the data? So just a few things. First, this presentation, as all of the presentations, is aligned to the format as indicated by the New Jersey Department of Education. However, throughout my slides are in the next couple of slides. You'll hear things regarding candid conversations, how we talk about the data. We always consider year to year results. The Start Strong data, though, is really intended to be used to provide classroom teachers with on demand results and information regarding the needs of their students, which allows them to adapt their instructional plans for based on the students they serve. Um, the NJ NJSLA data, which we have shared with you previously, is more suited to show growth over time. So while for this presentation, we're not talking about growth over time, it is certainly something that is considered in the work that we do. Um, it is important, though, that we compare students in a variety of ways because it will highlight curricular coherence and curricular incoherence, which is important when we um, talk about teaching and learning in the classroom setting. So as I mentioned, our emphasis is now really going to be not on the charts that we showed you, but how are we responding to the data that has been presented to us? So Mrs. Holmgren and I are going to go through several interventions that have been put into place over the last few months um, during this academic year. I will highlight for you you know, I'll stop there. Just let you jump in. So now that you have seen this data and following up on Dr. Mahan's points, you are probably asking, how are you responding to it and what interventions are in place? First, as you are aware, we are expected to use the Start Strong data in conjunction with our locally administered assessment data. I know I have said that several times, but it's a point that I really need to hammer home. An example I can provide you specifically targeting not only the Start Strong data, but using it in conjunction with our local um, assessment data. There is work that is being done at one of our elementary schools right now. This work is specifically being done with a group of grade four teachers, myself, 
the building principal, and both the literacy coach and the elementary math coach assigned to this specific school. This work has taken and is still being taken place during professional learning communities, which is a time carved out at the very beginning of the school day at the elementary level. Professional learning communities are otherwise known as PLCs. During these PLCs, PLC meetings, we looked at the fall 2022 Start Strong data, as well as results for ELA units one and unit two benchmarks, again, for grade four students. We found at this school specifically that there were trends in the data. And by trends, I mean specific ELA standards within all three of these assessments in which students did not perform well. We then target our, targeted our conversations with the teachers around the types of questions that they ask regularly during classroom instruction within these identified standards. We provided the teachers with explicit examples of questions that include rigor, which the standards are expecting. We use the Marzano Higher Model Order Questioning Tool as a resource to help the teachers understand further not only what the standard is inspecting, expecting, excuse me, so we unpacked it with them, but how to reframe the types of questions that they regularly ask during instruction that encourage their students to go beyond identifying and recalling facts to applying and analyzing that information. That is a, a specific example of a PLC, as I said, that is ongoing with a group of grade four teachers. Um, and it is really powerful work, powerful work. So many of the things that Mrs. Holmgren just described then connect directly to the next bullet that you see Teachers are implementing targeted instruction in small group and one-on-one. -on -one. Oftentimes you may hear the word conferring at the elementary level, as well as at the middle school level where teachers are working one-on-one -on -one with students and or small group with students. We have a designated period at the elementary school called intervention and enrichment, where there are several opportunities for this to occur. The block schedule intervention period at the middle school also allows for this. And then the lunch and learn period, which is embedded in the high school schedule, allows for this additional support and targeted instruction. In education, you often hear us talk about, we need to have many candid conversations. We have candid conversations around our data because it's tough to have conversations around data. It makes people feel uncomfortable. So these conversations occur with administrators and teachers, and they're focused upon the root cause analysis and action planning for moving forward. The goals that typically come out of these candid conversations are not just goals, but indicate and highlight action steps that must be taken in order for us to see a change in achievement. It is important to note that these efforts are not new and that these are part of an ongoing process that always allows opportunities to identify, discuss, and analyze achievement data. These conversations are connected to individual school-based goals, which are aligned to the district goals related to student achievement, which all fall under the purpose and passion goal. While engaged in these conversations, sometimes comparisons are made between the content areas, so oftentimes we are asked, you know, why are ELA scores declining or what's going on with science or I've noticed some changes in math data. So I just want to highlight specifically for ELA, our ELA scores have really been stable over uh, several years pre-pandemic. I would not um, generalize and say that the ELA scores are on a decline. Start strong is just one indicator of success. You heard Mrs. Holmgren talk several times in regards to um, several data points, so benchmark assessments and other locally administered tests. So start strong is just one of those indicators. Unfortunately, we have seen a decline in both ELA and math over the past three years due to the school closure. But math has been a specific focus there has been, excuse me, there has been a specific focus on the decline in the area of mathematics, even prior to the pandemic, which we have been having ongoing conversations about. 
the NJSLA data, which you saw previously, is now a baseline for us. And from that baseline, we only intend to increase student achievement, as I mentioned previously. I share all of this as an example because we always want to be cautious in how we discuss data and the impact of said data on our instructional decisions. You may have noticed in this presentation the intentional focus on the area of strong support needed, specifically in math achievement. This was done as we have had, again, ongoing conversations about math. The comments that I have moving forward in the next few areas will all focus and highlight math achievement. For math, We are currently, we currently have focused coaching with Great Minds on the Eureka Math implementation. Great Minds is the company who provides professional development for staff in the Eureka curriculum. The coaching is targeted and specific and to address instructional strategies, pedagogical thinking and follow-up support is then provided by our math coaches. I do remind you that at the elementary level for our 12 elementary schools, we have two math coaches. And for our secondary schools, we also have two math coaches. So they split their time across the 18 schools, not including the preschool, which would be the 19th. Each session, teachers participate and topics are directly correlated to assessment data, informal walkthrough data, and observations so that Again, everything is connected. In addition to the coaching cycles, which teachers are participating in with great minds, we also have coaching cycles with our math coaches, who again, work to ensure the fidelity of curriculum. The math coaches model lessons, they co-teach, they share resources and materials, they provide explanation of standards, and how the standard is to be taught in the classroom, which Mrs. Holmgren gave a very vivid example with the fourth grade model through PLC work. And then they also provide follow-up items taught um, during the coaching sessions. So almost like a handoff from the expert from Great Minds to the math coach here in district. Because we wanna ensure that our teachers have the math content that they need to be successful in the classroom, I highlight work that we are currently working on with Rowan University to support teacher mathematical content knowledge. There have been sessions at the secondary level and elementary teachers have been invited to participate in a math institute, which will begin in February. And lastly, I wanna highlight a few platforms that we use to support student achievement that students can access in school as well as at home. The first one for grades one through five is Zern, which is aligned to the Eureka Math Program. The platform allows students to explore grade level math with on-screen teachers, visual models, and digital manipulatives. The platform allows for differentiated support to help students learn from their mathematical errors. This supports intervention and enrichment. Extra Math is a math fluency platform that is used to enhance the math curriculum with math fact fluency. We all understand the importance of students understanding or having strong command of their math facts um, prior to um, moving forward in more advanced levels of math. Students can practice and build confidence by mastering addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and teachers are able to track the class as well as individual progress. So I highlight all of these because earlier in the presentation, I mentioned cur curricular coherence. This, all of the strategies that we talked about speak to ensuring that our curriculum is coherent, that it is aligned with the New Jersey student learning standards, and that it is supporting the students that we have in front of us. Um, we also want to ensure that in all of these areas, you notice that there is a strong emphasis on professional development for our teaching staff. Because again, without them um, having the resources and materials to be successful in the classroom, they, they would not be successful in the classroom. I 
Any questions? Dr. Rude. So I don't specifically have any questions. The presentation was very well done. Thank you. Um, I just want to point out, like, maybe things are bouncing back a little bit after the pandemic, and maybe Eureka Math is start, curriculum changes are starting to kick in. Um, but regardless of what it is, it's clear that um, what what our teachers are doing in the classroom and, and what administration is doing to work with our teachers is having a positive impact, and that's a really... A beautiful thing to see. And of course, um, I think we'll all be look, you know, on the board, I'll speak for myself only, but <laughs> we'll, I'll be continuing to advocate that we keep in, you know, really strong supports, kids that needed strong support yesterday, but are, you know, maybe scored a little bit better today. Those are, those kids are, I consider, think of uh, still at being at risk and needing those strong supports to maintain where they are. Um, so that's something I'll be looking for in the future, but it's really great to see that the, you know, that at least in this piece of data, um, you know, we're starting to make some recovery from the pandemic, which clearly affected math a little bit more than um, some of the English language learning stuff. Um, uh, so great job. Congratulations to our teachers on a on a, a job clearly well done. And, you know, he'll, we'll look forward to seeing things continue to improve in the future. So, thanks. Mr. Mayor. So um, <clears throat> let me follow on uh, with Dr. Ruth's comments. First of all, thank you. Um, it, was, it was a great, present, uh, great presentation. It's, it's, uh, it's good, it's important to see improvement. Um, what, what for me anyway is equally important is that that not be we don't take for granted that success and uh, not be comfortable with it and settle for it. And then hopefully, and it sounds like, um, it sounds like the, you know, the pedal is still on the accelerator and it needs to stay there um, to Dr. Rood's point, not just some of these students who may be at risk of sliding backwards, but all of our students um, deserve the kind of additional supports, the, the creative uh, sort of out of the box thinking sometimes um, to, to continue to excel. Um, so I hope that that's gonna continue. And, and these numbers, at least with regards primarily to math look good, um, but sometimes good isn't good enough. So good can always be better. Um, the Some of the ELA results don't look as promising. Maybe that's Again, to, there are many ways to look at at that achievement, and just looking at the results of one test is always um, dangerous. There's not enough data there, um, but that's something that hopefully you know we're not losing sight of, and keeping an eye on. And maybe that's a you know a light radar blip that you know, needs to be addressed. Um, and and when we talk about you know candid discussions about data sometimes making people uncomfortable. At least for me, I look at it differently. The candid conversations are tremendously important. Sometimes there aren't enough of those. But when those candid conversations lead to uh, the ability to identify better supports um, and better action items to improve student outcomes, there's nothing uncomfortable about that. In fact, that should be welcomed. And, and at least for me, you know, I hope we can play a role, whatever role, we can in helping to support you, helping to support the staff and administration in doing just that, right? Because that's what we're here. Keep hearing data, data, data. These are kids, right? It's not just numbers. Um, and it's it's the kids, it's their dreams, it's their hopes, it's it's their futures. Um, the data is, you know, is maybe a quick way to look at where they are. Um, and it's all of our jobs to do what we can to give them more opportunity so that where they are now is just a you know snapshot in time but we need to get them where they can be what so they can all meet their potentials um so i think these these candid conversations have to continue um again it's good to see this improvement um and i don't mean to minimize that at all so but let's let's keep it up and keep the keep the pedal on the accelerator thank you uh yes mrs gallagher so I have a couple questions. Um, you say that the results are immediate. What do you mean by that? 
Um, so they're instantaneous. So okay. if you were a student who was taking, you know, the start strong assessment, those results are instantaneous to the educator or to that child's teacher. Um, the results are not instantaneous to the public or to the parents. Okay. Um, so we are obligated within 30 days of receiving the actual hard copies of the um, data. We're obligated to share them with the community, with the parents, et cetera. And then within 60 days, obviously sharing the data of the whole to you all. Um, so it is instantaneous to the teachers, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily to um, the pub public. And that is set forth by the NJDOE. Okay, and then a follow-up. So this test is testing for last year. So if I'm a fourth grader and I tested for third grade and I didn't meet expectations on the assessment, how does the teacher include that type of information when there's already, you know, a learning like curriculum set for fourth grade if now they also have to add in extra third grade work? I can provide you with a specific example, and it's one of the interventions that we are using that is provided to us by Eureka. It is called Equip. Um, so essentially, at the start of every math unit, mm -hmm. the teachers administer um, an assessment. It's a very brief assessment to the students. And this assessment identifies the prerequisite skills that the students are lacking to move into this next unit. Mm -hmm. So not only does it identify that data to the students or to the teacher, because now what? Right. So she's also provided with instructional resources using technology to target those prerequisite skills in which the student is lacking in order to move forward. So it's kind of a double dose, mm -hmm. I want to say, um, because we are obligated as educators to continue with the pacing guide. Um, right within the curriculum. So this specific tool, Equip, allows us to do that. So we're allowed to able to provide interventions um, and supports while continuing um, with the curriculum. Are you That's just one specific example right. I can give you for math. Just, I'm curious, like, um, is it difficult? Are you hearing from the teachers that it's difficult to manage? Um, implementing like last year's work, this year's work, you know, it, it might be, especially if, if you think about it, each kid's potential deficit, let's say, could be unique to each child. The I only, mean, I know it's, there's one, usually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the pieces I can say is um, the, those prerequisite skills in which students may be lacking. Um, we have, it's a technology platform. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be one-on-one -on -one instruction. Right. It can be instruction using technology in order to address those prerequisite skills um, that the student is lacking. So it's not necessarily one-on-one -on -one with a teacher right. student, um, but we are provided, you know, the technology piece in order to um, kind of move forward. I'll, I'll jump in here too. So Mrs. Gallagher, what you're describing, I would say, is not unique to no. what you're seeing now. So teachers see students every day, every year who are coming in at a variety of levels. Um, and a, an example that I will provide to you is students who are entering full day kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So we have some students who are coming in as readers. We have some who are unable to identify all of their letters. Um, we have some who know all of their colors and some who do not. So I think what you're really describing is the ability for our teachers to be able to differentiate instruction based on the needs of the students. One of the things that I think we've done a really great job in over the years and have tried to foster with our teachers is small group instruction. And how do you look at your data to determine if students are going to be based, placed into strategy groups, skill-based groups? or ability groups, mm -hmm. because I may be a fluent reader, but I may need support with um, decoding. Mm -hmm. And I could be in one group with you today and then in a different group with some of my other peers tomorrow. So it is an area in which um, as a district, we have really focused hard on over the last, I would say, eight to 10 years on providing teachers with um, specific strategies on how to confer with students one-on-one -on -one to give them each individual student what they need, as well as in small groups to calibrate for um, students who need intervention and or for students who need enrichment. Another thing you'll also see in our curriculum is that many of the skills scaffold 
would meaning that teachers are teaching a skill in third grade, mm -hmm. you will also see that skill or concept, but, a, but at a more advanced or developed le level in fifth grade and sixth grade, all the way up through algebra. So um, the instructional coaches that we do have in place are intentional about helping teachers to be able to see if a child is doing this in class, what are the requisite skills that are really needed or prerequisite skills that are needed to ensure that we are closing the um, instructional gap that may have been in, in there for you know, for a skill that, that may have been missed? Mm -hmm. And how do we backfill that to make sure that they not only get what they miss, but then have the skills necessary to move forward? One last question. Um, is this easier to implement in elementary school versus middle and high school? Because I guess, is there like a, a greater control because elementary is a single, you know, potentially like a single teacher or two teachers in a room versus middle school and high school where there's multiple teachers. And I, um, and then, you know, my children are in elementary school, like they're going to listen to the teachers, middle and high school students might not, right? Like I have a stepson who's in high school and we're like, go talk to your teacher. You know, so I'm curious if there are different strategies that you're implementing to, to target the students who might be in some strong support in middle and high school to like incentivize them to go to the lunch and learns or like the other, you know, um, things that you're offering to help maybe advance those students. Thank you. Yeah, so so there are, uh, at the high school uh, level, there are different type of interventions. Obviously, the structure of the day is just different, being that, you know, it's more of a departmentalized um, rotation of courses. But there are courses that are built in within the schedule that students can take, that students can be placed into. Um, as part of the INRS process at both of the high schools, they have study skills that are attached and run parallel to that. So once students are identified as having um, needs in a particular area, they can put a complementary study skills or uh, in, in place uh, to support the child as well. Uh, there are seminar classes we've talked about uh, quite a bit, seminar English, seminar mathematics as well to support um, children. Just looks, it looks differently in elementary. Uh, having been there, I think, you know, obviously th there is more time in the day, but even within their the structure of their days, they're defined times and periods um, to work with children. I think it all goes back to teachers' knowledge and understanding of their of their kids. This assessment here was actually given during like the first two to three weeks of the year. It was prior to any instruction even being delivered. So it was for the purpose of obtaining information to do exactly what I'm talking about. Teacher receives this information. They know where the kids are. All of these, um, these assessments relate back to the standards. Uh, Dr. Mayhem mentioned the scaffolding that occurs. The scaffolding occurs because the standards are, are the same. As they progress in, in grade, it's just sophistication that's necessary. As you move up in grade, you know, it gets more, more rigorous. Um, and students are expected to do more with um, those standards and with the content information and knowledge. But, um, but the opportunities exist at, at both places. Ms. Omar Stratton. Thank you, Ms. Holmgren, for the presentation. And I just wanted to uh, just say thank you to uh, Dr. Mayhem for laying the structure of what this presentation is ahead of time. Um, I think that's really helpful for us to know what this is. And, you know, it is just a tool specifically for the instructors. And so knowing that and hearing that what this tool is, it actually helps us in these conversations with these presentations so that no one walks away. The, these can be charged up convos. And sometimes it can vilify a certain group or certain populations or even a teacher or admin or a building. And it's not necessary and unnecessary conversations are created by stuff where we don't have the background and the knowledge. So I appreciate you giving that base knowledge for us of exactly what this is. It's specifically for teachers to guide their differentiated instruction moving forward and make sure that their interventions and teaching is targeted. So I think I look forward to, you know, thank you for sharing. This is one of those things that you don't have to share because this is this is mandatory for you to share, but this is really for just the teachers to use so they know what they're going to do the next steps. Um, and, and thank you for breaking down that. Once again, achievement has 
a whole myriad of things that's a part of it. So um, this is just the behind the scenes piece that the instructors are using in those PLC groups. Um, and that I think that was just really important to say. So thank you, Dr. Mahan, for laying that out very clearly so that everybody has an understanding before we dive into it. So thanks so much. Mrs. Winters. Thank you. I just want to echo a little bit of what Ms. Elmore Stratton said, and thank you to the administration, Dr. Mahan, Ms. Holmgren, Dr. Morton. Um, I found this presentation to be extremely useful. The analysis um, in the math scores and the direction that our scores are going, which is very positive, was a nice trend line for us to see. And I, I personally found the specific examples of the intervention strategies that you are already using, um, how you take this data and you and the teachers um, take action based on it. I found that really helpful in understanding sort of how this data is used um, on the regular by our teachers. Um, I think just to kind of address some of the things Mr. Mayor was saying, um, we understand that this is a quick snapshot. This was given the first two weeks of school. It was a quick test um, to take the temperature of where our students are. Um, I'm really excited about the work that the Curriculum and Instruction Committee is going to do going forward, taking this as a building block, but also looking at a more holistic view of achievement going forward and all of its facets, um, not just standardized test data, but other ways that we can think about data. We talked about the district level assessments. We talked about the goals. Um, there's a lot of different ways to think about this. Um, um, and I think the committee is going to do a, a really good job, hopefully, in the next few months, taking all these different pieces, understanding them, and then making sure that we're able to target more supports to even enhance further the wonderful work that our teachers are doing um, post-pandemic and helping our st students really achieve their potential. Um, so thank you again so much for everything that you're doing. We do appreciate it. We appreciate all the work our teachers are clearly doing. We can see it in the scores and we look forward to continued work on this going forward and continued supports. Thank you. Mrs. Fleischer. Thank you so much. And I do want to thank Dr. Mahan and Ms. Holbrun and our teachers and um, uh, Dr. Morton and everyone involved with this because it's it is a great presentation. So we appreciate all the information. Um, I just wanted to ask a quick question as far as am I correct in say, thinking because we're really focusing tonight on math and those scores and it's been amazing like to be able to see such an increase. Especially I I like the the thought process of what Dr. Rude was saying that we're actually seeing Eureka Math in action, which is really amazing because you very rarely can really see you know an intended curriculum and really get some um, some percentage points and actually data right away. Um, and I think it's wonderful. Can um, Am I correct in thinking that with ELA, um, the, the same type of differentiated instruction is happening sort of in parallel? Tonight, we're really focusing on math, but is that something, you know, I'll just throw out there now. <laughs> I was going to say yes. And one of the strengths that Mrs. Holmgren brings to the position is that she is a former literacy teacher coach. So that is really her background and expertise. So she can attest to the parallels that we've described for math are certainly happening <coughs> Excuse me, in ELA and have really been the model for how we model instruction for math. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Mrs. Gallagher. Um, have you heard of any indications that this test will be ongoing? Sorry. Uh, when, I get, when I get <laughs> hot, I cough. Um, so we have not heard any indication. There was a significant amount of conversation regarding the Start Strong assessment because it was only supposed to be implemented during the school closure. And for one year after, we have had no indication from the Department of Education that Start Strong will be going away. We do intend, if told, that we will be um, administering the assessment again in the spring as well as again in the fall. Not the Start Strong in the spring, just Start Strong in the fall. NJSLA. Sorry. I'm yes, trying to speak for Dr. Mahan right yes, now. Yes, as I'm <laughs> dying over here. So we will administer NJSLA in the spring and then we assume again, start strong in the fall. So if you want to like believe that maybe this might be an ongoing assessment, at least for the short term, let's say, and I know that it's like, it's useful for the teachers. And I know that like teachers have been kind of being pushed in a lot of different directions in the last couple of years. We all have, right. I'm not going to discount anybody else, but, um, 
you know, I, I get that things have gotten better, you know, numbers have changed, but I mean, it's still kind of like a 50, 50 split, right? Like, so you can say that 50, like a set, if you look at it in a raw situation, 50% of the kids have essentially met expectations and 50% have not depending on the spectrum at which you, whether it's a lot or a little. Um, and because things are scaffolded, you know, there is an element for, for me personally as looking at this data where, you know, if a child has not met certain milestones, I don't know, I'm not going to, I'm probably not going to use the correct language, right? Um, there's probably a better chance that that child may continue to not, you know, um, and for no other, you know, um, no blame mm -hmm. other than just school disruptions have affected children. You know, I, I can tell from like, from just from what I'm here from the district, like teachers are dealing with like different uh, behavioral issues. Like what have I here? Learned helplessness, right? Um, you know, a lot of other things. And so um, I don't, I never wanna say like um, that people are not doing their job correctly, I think the circumstances at which the job is being done are different, right? And so I don't, and I, I guess my question is, is like, if looking at these numbers, you can essentially say that like 50% of the student population is not meeting expectations. How are the teachers supposed to deal with that? And, and how are we as board administration, supposed to, you know, accurately tackle that. So I'm gonna jump in here and <clears throat> I'm assuming Dr. Morton has thoughts about this too, but um, I think that's a, a big, big question. Um, you know, when you, number one, I just wanna remind everyone, we're in the business of educating kids. That's why we're here. So when we have conversations around achievement, we are disappointed if there's one child who is not meeting with success within our schools. So I wanna make sure that we keep the focus on achievement for all students. <clears throat> Over the course of the pandemic, um, we have had several conversations regarding how as a district we are responding to the needs of the students that we serve. So you have seen things like care solace, you have seen um, other uh, mental health supports put in place. You have seen um, targeted um, support, not only for teachers, but workshops for parents and how to support their children. So all of those things are really happening in tandem with continuing to implement our curriculum with fidelity. So sometimes, as we saw during the pandemic, those things become out of whack because you have to address students' social emotional needs because if they are not feeling confident in the classroom and they are not grounded mentally and socially, then they are unable to learn, right? So we also are talking about teachers having relationships with kids and the importance of relationships with kids because kids don't learn from teachers they don't like. So all of those things are happening all at the same time. So is it difficult? Absolutely. Have teachers dealt with this in previous years on a much smaller scale? Absolutely. But I think at this point, our teachers have really adapted and are meeting kids where they are. And then from there, making sure that they are continuing to implement the curriculum with fidelity. Being a teacher is hard work. It is hard work. And I think our teachers show up every day for the students that they serve. So your question, I say, is just, it's so big because I think every teacher, if we had 10 in the room tonight, they would have 10 different responses to how they are responding to what they are doing in their classroom. It's going to be different from kindergarten to a senior, you know, philosophy class to a social studies class in the middle school or humanities class. So a lot of it also is how one intrinsically is responding to 
the effects of the school closure and of the pandemic. Um, you know, I don't think that that is something that is unique to the profession of teaching. I think that is something that has been seen across all professions. So I don't really know if that answers your question, but I think that the <clears throat> knowing that all of those things are happening in tandem and they will continue to happen in tandem um, is, is really the only response. I mean, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I, I echo everything that uh, Dr. Mahan said. I, I think the other thing that needs to be noted as well is that um, teachers experienced the pandemic as well. And, you know, the emotionality that, you know, went along with that and feelings of isolation, separation, not knowing and new normal and all those things, you know, they 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 lived that as well and are, are carrying that with them. I think um, we've seen it in just in terms of the numbers in the profession and, you know, seeing people leaving, teacher shortage and people leaving the profession. Um, I'll, I'll essentially echo as well, especially echo the, the idea that it's hard work, but, you know, this is the work that we signed up for. This is what we do. We love children. And, um, you know, we, we, we try to figure out ways to impact them and to, and to help them to learn and grow, um, even in the most unique circumstances. I didn't expect you to have an answer, but <laughs> I knew that that was a bigger question, but I appreciate what you said. And I, yes, of course, it's like, if you could boil it down to one answer, it's like, if it was, if it was that easy, we'd all be doing it. Right. So um, I'm not, no accusations, no nothing. And I, yeah, the teach, I mean, it was just, it's just more of like a, we're in a unique circumstance and it's just like, how many times can people be pulled in six different directions? Right. Cause just as you said, like, you know, a kindergarten class is going to be unique to a, 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 a senior class but this kindergarten class is gonna be unique to next kindergarten, right? So like the kindergarten teacher this year might feel equipped to handle those, the kids that she had, he or she has in class, but then next year it could be like a whole host of different, you know? So it's just, uh, it's just, that's like, when I see this, I tried, that's that's kind of what I'm seeing it as. It's like this, this it's a broader issue that like, you know, if we're looking at the raw data, which I know it's like, this is just one indication in many, but it's still an indication, right? It's still some, it's not that it, it can be discounted, but thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mrs. Stern, can I just add, um, Mrs. Gallagher did mention that this kindergarten class is going to be different than the uh, next kindergarten class. I just want to do a shameless plug for <laughs> kindergarten registration, which has begun for Cherry Hill Public Schools. And we are just as excited this year for the implementation of full day kindergarten as we were three years ago when we implemented. And we are looking to have a class go through full day kindergarten with a full uninterrupted year of instruction so that we can start to see uh, the fruits of our labor with the full day um, kindergarten committee. So we practice parents, that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I love the shameless plug. So thank you, Dr. Mayhem. Any other board members have any questions? So I just would like to, first of all, thank um, everybody involved. Um, Ms. Holmgren, um, Dr. Uh, uh, Morton and Dr. Mayhan, um, Dr. Malash. Um, and I, I really want to thank um, the board for um, digging in to this significantly. Um, you know, Mrs. Winters, you have led the CNI committee. Um, talk about candid conversations. Talk about talk about um, multiple hours of meetings and readings and and conversations. Um, this is, you know, this is something that the board is really, you know, digging into. Um, and, um, you know, it is our highest um, charge. And, you know, you know, the New Jersey School Board Association says school boards absolutely have the ability to impact positively or not achievement. Um, and so, you know, I'm, you know, I'm very pleased um, the direction we're moving in. Um, I think we obviously see mixed results on this initial testing that started the year. Um, you know, I think it's really important that we have our our teachers um, and our coaches and, and administrators all have this information in order to make sure that the students through the year have 
what they need. Um, and I think, you know, Mrs. Gallagher, I think you, you know, um, when you talk about the recognition of kind of the lift, this heavy lift um, of multiple different pieces and moving parts. Uh, and I, you know, I, I think the depth of that is, is kind of significant that I think as a board, you know, we can see from a very just bird's eye view, but um, we're not, you know, living it day to day the way the staff and administration are. So, um, and, and the students are, you know, so um, I think it's a really important piece. Um, and as, you know, as that kind of reality hits us um, week after week with our, you know, the work we do, the time we spend, um, it's, you know, it's, helpful to see this information. Um, I think understanding that, you know, we do have, um, you know, ELA coaches in every elementary school. We don't have math coaches in every elementary school. There are things we're looking at budgetarily um, to ensure that we're supporting um, the interventions that that need to happen. Um, and that that's something that we're really digging into. So, um, you know, this is, a, I think, a very, a real conversation. <laughs> which is important and uh, we'll continue to have them. Uh, and I look forward to CNI. Um, for those of us who are on the committee, <laughs> continuing to do lots, have lots more work together with the administration um, and, and moving in the right direction. So kind of a broader stroke on the, on the presentation, but um, I think that's it. So thank you. And I thank you, Mrs. Holmgren. Thank you. And um, I believe we'll move on to uh, the next Another heavy lift, and that is budget stuff. So, Dr. Dr. Malash. Thank you, Ms. Stern. Uh, and thank you, Ms. Holmgren and Ms. Smalldorf for putting everything together. Dr. Mahan, Dr. Morton for your involvement in the presentation. Much appreciated. Yes, we have one administrative report this evening, Ms. Stern. Uh, Mrs. Sugars is going to deliver a budget update. As you know, um, budget season never really ends in Cherry Hill. Um, we start the construction of um, the next year's uh, fiscal year budget around the beginning of October. Um, so Mrs. Sugars uh, and Mrs. Switansky and their team in the business office have gotten input and support and information from all the different departments, the principals at all the different buildings. Um, you know, and, and we are in the place right now where uh, we are deep in the construction of the budget. So Mrs. Sugars, I know you are going to you have your presentation that is being shared and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Malash. So we're still somewhat early in the process, um, but I anticipate that we'll be having updates from now until we um, until we approve our initial submission budget in March. So let's start by talking. Um, let's just jump right into tax levy, right? Because that's the biggest part of our budget, um, and uh, Let's, let's start there. So uh, what I included tonight is an analysis of um, the tax levy that supports our budget uh, since 2018-19. In 2018-19, you'll see that we had two buckets of tax levy. One was for the general fund and the other was for debt service fund. That was the last year that we paid on the previous bond from 20 years ago. Um, and that's also why in 2018, we had done the initial um, bond referendum. Um, so uh, you can see there in 2018-19 that, that after that year, uh, debt service tax fund levy dropped off. When we're preparing our budget, uh, we do not uh, take that into consideration in terms of the preparation of our budget because that tax levy has already been approved by the public through the bond referendum process. Um, we focus on the general fund tax levy, and the general fund tax levy is the tax levy that supports the day-to-day -day operations of the district. So you can see there um, since 2018-19 through 22-23 what the increases were each year um, from a dollar standpoint and also from a percentage standpoint, and then also at the bottom what the estimated tax impact was from those increases. So I wanted to point out two things. Um, if you look at the percentage increase, um, our budget, uh, our tax levy increase is held to a 2% uh, tax increase each year, unless um, if you look under 20, 
21, you can see there that it was 3.3%. Um, that year, we qualified for what's called a spending growth limitation adjustment. A spending growth limitation adjustment for various reasons for that particular year, it was for enrollment. We have also um, at times qualified for it for the cost of our health benefits. Also allows us to expand our cap beyond the 2%. Um, typically, we don't qualify for them. Occasionally we do. It just depends on how much our enrollment increases year over year and how much our health benefits increase year over year. So in that particular year, we actually went higher than the 2%. And then you'll notice in 21, 22 and 22, 23, we were actually less than the 2%. And we'll talk about what happens when we go below the 2% tax levy cap um, as we get a little further along. So that's kind of the landscape. You can see that um, 21, 22, um, there was a $25 tax impact for the average assessed home, 22, 23, a $65 tax impact for the average assessed home. So then also let's look at state aid. Um, state aid over the past couple of years, you can see we've had some decent increases since the 2018-19 school year. Um, in the 2021 school year, we actually had a higher increase that year. We actually received almost $2.4 million more in state aid when we initially put our budget together. And then by August, because of the pandemic, we were told that our state aid was gonna be cut and so even though we had established our budget that year in August of that school year, uh, we had to cut our budget by $2,369,000 because the state pulled back how much state aid they were giving to each district. Um, we were fortunately anticipating that and we were prepared for that and we were able to maintain our programs and our personnel because we took all of those cuts out of projects um, and equipment and things of that nature. So um, the good news is, is that um, we still saw some significant increases in our state aid uh, after the pandemic. You can see in the 21-22 school year that um, it went up pretty significantly to 24.6 million. And then in 22-23, 29.5 million. <clears throat> We're not anticipating these large jumps uh, as we move forward. Um, right now we are anticipating fairly flat state aid um, and that's what we'll use when we build our budget uh, moving forward into 23-24 until we know exactly when the, what the numbers are. So I mentioned the, um, <clears throat> the two years that we didn't go to the full 2% uh, of the tax levy. And what that allows us to do is uh, accumulate banked cap. So banked cap is when the full 2% tax levy increase is not used during the budget year, we can bank uh, the difference. People think it's a pot of money. It is not a pot of money. It is taxing authority. So it allows us to go uh, above the 2% um, because we didn't go up to the 2% in prior years. It's a three-year rolling cycle. Um, you have to use it or it expires. So um, banked cap that we generated in 21-22 will expire in 24-25, and banked cap that we generated in 22-23 will expire in 25-26 if it is not used. But we do have the opportunity, should, should we decide to do that, to include that as well. And so this is a breakdown of the 22-23, and I, I, we use some very broad categories. We actually will do um, a breakdown, uh, a, lar um, a more finite breakdown once we have uh, our numbers a little more um, finished up uh, for 23-24. But right now, uh, I just wanted to kind of go over this. I know that as a board and as a BNF committee, we have discussed kind of what our budget looks like and what the breakdown looks like, just some things to keep in mind um, as we move ahead. So um, our budget, as you can see, is very personnel driven. 73% when you take salaries and benefits makes up our budget each year, which leaves us with 25% of our budget for other. And other is anything that is not a salary or a benefit. And so when we talk about other, um, I'll give you the top five because we 
as a committee have gone through this and kind of done this breakdown because it sounds $59 million sounds like a lot of money, but when you start to kind of break it down and see where that money is going, you realize that it's not as much money as you think it is. So the number one item under that other category is transportation, and that's 14.2 million. And that's about 24% of the 59 million. The next would be out of district tuition. That's $9.8 million. That's 16.7% of the 59 million. Uh, next, um, educational services, uh, contracted services, special ed, homebound speech, those kinds of things. Um, that's the third category. That's 11.8% of our annual budget, 6.9 million. And then we jump down to classroom supplies and textbooks, 3.4 million or 5.8% of our budget. And finally, utilities um, is number five, 5.4%, $3.1 million. So when you add up, you know, those top five categories and you've paid for your transportation, your out of district tuition, your utilities, your educational services, and your classroom supplies, that doesn't leave a whole lot um, for other things. When you think about district insurance, you think about copier leases, um, <clears throat> technology equipment and services, <clears throat> maintenance, custodial grounds and security is $3 million. So those things add up quickly. Um, and they they take up you know a lot of that other category. So <clears throat> this idea that we sort of have a lot of discretionary income in our budget is really not true. Um, and then also capital reserve, we have over the past couple of years used some pretty significant capital reserve in our budget. This year we'll actually be using capital reserve towards the payment of our bond service debt. Um, also though, as you know, because we've talked about this as well, the state has opened up a rod grant application process where you can apply for a rod grant rod stands for regular operating district um, but with that rod grant application um, the state will give you 40 percent of the funding you still have to come up with your 60 percent so the state is not entertaining uh, applications where a bond referendum is involved so we've been talking to uh our architect about what that looks like and what type of projects could we apply for that will fit within the parameters of what the state is looking for. So if anything, moving into 23-24, we would be allocating funds to cover that 60% of our share of the project and then also you know, aiding us in um, payment of our debt. If we flip it over and we look at the break breakdown of how the revenues make up our budget, you can see here, that 80% of our budget is funded by taxes in comparison to 14% of our budget that is funded by state aid. And then we have some various other small categories of revenues such as miscellaneous revenues, fund balance, which actually comes out of our, out of our own district pocket, um, a very small amount of federal aid in the general fund budget. We have more federal aid in the special revenue budget. Um, and then also the capital reserve number. So you can see that um, if you take the taxes, the fund balance, the miscellaneous revenues, um, and the and the capital reserve, that you know within Cherry Hill we're funding 86% of our budget uh, before we get any help from outside. So this is our timeline. As Dr. Malash mentioned, we released our budget information to the schools in October. Uh, we give them until mid-December to do their input. Um, and then we, uh, as a superintendent's council and administration, start to review that budget. We had a meeting last week where we started to do some of that and look at various things. I highlighted January 24th. That's where we are tonight. We're just doing our initial budget discussion um, here tonight. Um, and then I anticipate as we move forward, um, our BNF committee meetings and our board meetings will have an update until we get to our March um, 14th meeting, um, that will be the night that we have to approve our initial submission budget. Um, by state statute, um, the initial submission budget needs to be approved by March 20th. What happens after that is uh, we submit everything to the county office uh, the, through the budget software that the state issues. Um, then we also have a lot of um, supporting documentation that goes with that as well. Uh, we submit all of that to the county office, the county reviews it, and then they come back and they give us approval, hopefully, um, to go ahead and have our public hearing. 
Right now, our public hearing is scheduled for April 25th. Once we have our public hearing and the board approves that budget, then we're set for the year, and then we can start planning for the following fiscal year. So when you look at it, you start <laughs> in October and you end in, in April, um, it's, it's a fairly lengthy process. So when we look at next steps, because again, we're still somewhat, um, you know, just in the initial uh, steps here, where are we in the process? So the state budget software was released last week. So that's good news because there's lots of information that we will have to start inputting into that once we kind of finalize our number. We take our position control roster that is uh, prepared by our HR department. We have to put that into the county required format. Um, which includes a lot of uh, health benefit information. And then we also have to put that information into our budget software so that we can start looking at how those numbers add up and what that looks like. We also learned last week that the CPI for the 23-24 school year will be 5.86%. And what that means is that we can now start reaching out to our transportation contractors to see if they will renew under that rate, or if they don't renew, then we know that we have to put those routes out to bid. So the sooner we know that information, the sooner we can start planning for that. Um, we also have to start analyzing our revenues and looking at that. What, you know, what, what is the board comfortable with in terms of tax levy? You know, we've talked about adding a lot of positions and doing some different things. Um, so what does that look like in terms of, you know, what are we comfortable with? And then finally, what is our state aid going to look like? We'll complete our administrative review over the next couple of weeks and finalize our personnel recommendations. And then we have to wait for the kind of the last two pieces of the puzzle, uh, one being our state aid numbers. The governor is required to provide his address by the fourth Tuesday of the month in February. That would be February 28th, which means we would have our state aid numbers on March 2nd. I'm personally hoping that he doesn't wait that long, um, but we'll see, you know, kind of what that looks like. We have not been given a date as of yet as to when that's going to happen. And then also health benefits um, that tends to come later in March um, or late February, early March. Um, and as you saw, health benefits is 25% of our budget. Um, so that's a big piece. Um, you know, last year we had a fairly significant increase. If you averaged it out over four years worth of increases, it came out to about 6%. Um, so we're, you know, anxious to see what happens this year. We've had some conversations at BNF about how it's not necessarily trending the way we would like to see it. Um, but we're hoping that, you know, maybe it'll start trending the other way. We'll have some better information about that um, come in the next couple of weeks. So those are two really big pieces that unfortunately don't come until the end of the process. And that's all I have. Do you have, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. I think I saw Ms. Elmer Stratton's hand first, and then we'll go to Mrs. Fleischer. Thank you, Sister. Thank you so much, Mr. Sugars. I just had two questions for the um when 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 the budget goes out to the various departments or schools or admins, do are they told to budget flat for this next year or are they allowed to actually dream big for what's actually going to happen and then get wait to get cut or so what we do is we tell them that um so they have access to our online accounting fiscal and accounting uh program and so they actually physically input their budgets they're held to the same amount that they had this year so they're told to budget flat within that the, they then fill out what we call an additional spending request which they submit um, to me, and then that's what we as administration take a look at um, about, you know, going above what their budget was the year before and how would they be using those funds. Okay, so they do get a chance to take a shot at their dreams. I do. <laughs> the dream money. Um, and then my other question was just, what did CPI stand for? That's the only one of them. Consumer price index. Oh, okay. So, so it's, it's like interesting. What they can go up on in terms of cost? Correct. Okay. So the state establishes that number and it's interesting because um, I don't, you know, how they come up with that number, I don't ask those questions, but um, so last year it was like 2.86 and everybody was shocked because, you know, we could see where the economy was going and we knew that gas was going up and, and everything else. So um, this I think is a little more in line and I think our contractors hopefully will be more inclined to renew at that amount. Um, with the cost, you know, the cost of um, paying bus drivers has gone up, the cost of fuel has gone up, uh, the cost of buses has gone up. So um, I know that was 
a little rough for them to swallow last year. A lot of contractors did not renew at that rate. We're hoping that since it's up a little bit more this year, that they will renew at that rate. However, that also means that our transportation costs will be going up as well. Um, but we had anticipated that. Thank you. It's, so it's almost like the, like how the government sets the indirect percentage. For, yes. Okay. Yep. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Fleischer. Thank you so much for um, the presentation. And it was actually more of a statement, I think, uh, that um, I sort of feel like I needed to make. Um, being on the BNF committee, I know I've learned a lot um, and now I'm off. So at least I'm carrying that with me. Um, but one of the statement that I wanted to make is that something that I'm really thinking about going into this budget hearing, I think like I myself and we all have to be cognizant that we just passed a historic bond of 363 million. And I'm so grateful for the Cherry Hill taxpayers for trusting us to do this um, and to um, spend the money wisely and correctly. And I just think when we're going with the budget, um, I would love to add so much. I just think we need to be cognizant of the taxpayers. I think we need to be cognizant of everything that's going on in the world right now and the economy. Um, and not to say that I'm a, I'm not against any anything specifically. I just think in that realm, um, for me, I'm really thinking about that going into this budgeting. Um, so, and I know that we've talked about this before, but I just felt the need that um, to bring that up. So thank you. Other board member comments, questions? Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ms. Sugars, thank you um, as always. And obviously as a member and now chair of uh, business and facilities. Um, I know how hard you and your staff works to put this together. I think it's it's helpful um, to get this kind of um, overview of where things stand. Um, we are all um, aware of of you know the the struggles that that we have individually in our own families, other other families, and and so you know being fiscally responsible. Um, whether or not the bond, you know, fortunately it did pass, even if it hadn't, we, these issues would still be important to all of us. So we're, we're all very mindful of that. And, and I know that um, C&I and, 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 and all of the other committees are, are, are equally um, looking at that, you know, that lens is on everything when it comes to what will be asked uh, of us in the budget. Can we, can we afford to add here or there? Where can we, where can we realize some efficiencies? Um, so, but, but I also want to thank you for um, having your staff ready to go. I know it was just last week that the, the um, budget software was finally opened up and we talked about this in committee and, and you had confirmed over and over again that um, the numbers were ready. So as soon as that software was available, you could get, get moving. I know that's happening. And so we appreciate that. Um, we look forward to, you know, continue to work with you through the committee and uh, make sure that, um, you know, we can support um, your efforts and know that your efforts support um, everything that we're doing here um, for the students, for the staff. Um, so it's really, you know, no questions, you know, with plenty of those in committee. I uh, just want to thank you for taking the time to to bring everyone else up to speed on on these issues tonight. Other board members, any more comments or questions? So I want to um, thank Mrs. Sugars um, for a uh, you know, really helpful in-depth presentation on the budget. Um, and um, I also want to just really thank you for starting these conversations with the board and committee with a lot of information in the fall. Um, that was really the request and ask of the board is that we start these conversations early in within the board and that's happening and, in, and with great detail. So that's been really, really helpful. Um, I want to thank Mr. Mayor and um, thank you for uh, taking over chairing BNF. I'm very glad it's you and not me. <laughs> I must say, um, you know, I I remember the conversations about bank about um, the consumer price index last year, um, and then throughout the year after it was such a low increase, we had so many bus routes that would not renew that wanted to rebid. Um, and we are approving almost every meeting, We not every, but many meetings, we have had to approve bus contracts and other transportation contracts. And some of the dollar amounts, my mouth just hangs open. I cannot get over the amount of money we have to spend and we need to, and it's 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 necessary 
um, but what it's costing us just for transportation and seeing that it's what I guess five percent of our total. I'm trying to do the twenty four percent of our category of other 24 percent of our fifty nine million is going towards transportation, which is a percentage a total percentage of our our overall budget. Is it five or four percent? Which I'm t- I didn't do those numbers. I'm I, sorry. I, I'm trying to do them in my head, and I'm not doing a very good job. But um, I mean, it's it's a thinking about if we're renewing contracts that are if we're lucky, they'll accept the the CPI, which is almost 6%. Well, listen, it's, it's a, it's a crapshoot on their side too, because, Correct. you know, they, they lose the routes. They may not, they go out to bid, they may not necessarily get them back. Yeah. So they have to, they have to weigh which, that as well. Which happened actually, yeah. you know, we, we, we went through that with one, one situation, if I recall properly over the summer, we had that conversation. So it's just really tough. You know, I, I think trying to figure out, um, you know, and I think the board, you know, has had many conversations already and is through BNF about and through CNI about, you know, looking for, as Mr. Mayor referred to efficiencies. So, I mean, I think, you know, I think our commitment as a board is to, again, be thorough, thoughtful, um, look out for the best interests of the students and be considerate of the entire town at the same time, which is a tough balance uh, sometimes. But, you know, try to try to make, you know, make sure we do that. Um, and to be good stewards, ultimately. Um, so, you know, so thank you. And more to come. It's ramping up. So, okay. All right. And we move on to um, correspondence. So do any of our board members have correspondence? And we'll start with Mr. Greenbaum. Thank you. Uh, so got off to a, a great start this year. Uh, I was able to attend Family Math Night at Cooper Elementary School. Uh, they did a really wonderful job hosting a fun night filled with math-related activities. Uh, it was very well attended. It was wonderful seeing the kids participating or even just running around. They seemed to, have, seemed to be having a good time. Uh, and it was, very, uh, it was very nice connecting with teachers, staff, and parents. Uh, a big thank you to Mrs. Tiernan, the principal, uh, and the amazing staff and volunteers at Cooper for having me. Uh, I enjoyed this event as both a board member uh, and as a Cooper parent. Um, I also had an opportunity to attend a monthly meeting for Garden State Coalition of Schools. Um, they featured uh, an informative presentation on mental and physical health screenings and how they might fit in with the framework of school nursing practices. Uh, it included some very eye-opening statistics. 25% uh, of schools in the U.S. have no nurse or healthcare provider available. And as many as 50% of children age 8 to 15 are experiencing, uh, that are experiencing mental health condition don't receive treatment. Um, so there are some great discussions on reducing in incidences of suicide, self-harm, depression, school violence, and really a great focus on opportunities to improve overall mental health, uh, physical health, and improve academic outcomes. Uh, so I found it to be very, uh, very interesting, and I look forward to future meetings. Thank, Thank you. you. That's great. Thank you, Mr. Greenman. Any other correspondence from board members? Uh, Mrs. Winters? Thanks. I had the opportunity to attend the open house at Cherry Hill High School West with my son, who sat as far away from me in the auditorium as humanly possible and visibly cringed when my name was said. So that was entertainment for the night. Um, it was actually a wonderful presentation. I was really impressed with all the West students who got up on stage and volunteered that night to show the incoming um, freshmen what West is all about. Um, there was a really wide range of students who came to talk about arts and sports and activities and everything that West has to offer. And then there were two rooms full of um, tables that kids could visit about academic and social opportunities at West. Um, so it really was a great night. And my nephew and my son and I were the last people out of the building because they enjoyed it so much. I think people were laughing at us. Um, but I think that says that it was success. So it was great to be at West. Thank you. Okay, we'll keep going. Dr. Rude. So last week I attended the um, fair funding uh, committee presentation or meeting. Um, not presentation, but meeting. Um, at the meeting, um, one of the, the major things discussed is the fact that last year, and correct me if I'm wrong, was the first year we've received full funding based on the equation. Um, so the state has an equation that sets, sets what the funding levels are or should be. 
Um, so the committee discussed their like desire to have input from uh, from the board, from community members to kind of, you know, ask the question, what should the purview of the of that committee be going going forward? Um, one of the things that the committee talked about is the fact that even though we reached quote unquote full funding, the equation is pretty old. Um, and therefore we can kind of ask in light of current demographics, current, you know, the current um, funding, like, is it, is it acceptable? Is it the right amount? Is it the, is it, I hate the term fair funding because you know, I've always told my kids don't, you know, we don't say fair, we like come up with a different word, like life's not fair, but, but <laughs> what, what we would like is equitable funding, funding that matches the needs of our district. Um, I just, uh, a quick diversion to say thank you to Mrs. Sugars for the, for the budget info. I want to point out that in the, in the budget um, pamphlet, uh, so 80% is listed as taxes. That's our local taxes, right? Um, the state aid, that fourteen percent, that is also taxes. Like that's that's money from our our state government, but it's generated from the income taxes for the state and probably you know what other other revenue sources they have. What's that? Income tax and lottery. Tax and lottery. So. Um, you know, so are we getting a proper share of that? That that was one of the discussion points uh, for that for that um, uh, committee meeting. Um, there will be an opportunity for uh, the board and for community to engage more on that issue. Um, uh, I think um, uh, Mrs. Wilson and Mrs. Sugars have reached out and um, scheduled for the fair funding committee to to present to the board at the next strategic strategic planning committee meeting on February 7th. So um, we'll be looking forward to that presentation and kind of whatever discussion comes about um, talking about the future of fair funding committee and um, the future of discussions around state funding and, and what can we do. And um, I'd like to, I'll just throw out a little plug because it helps our district. Um, February 14th, the Fair Funding Committee is doing a, a tweet campaign. So if parents in the district want to uh, reach out to their legislators and say, hey, you know, make sure we get fair funding again this year and and let's keep up the good work. Um, I think that's greatly appre appreciated. And um, yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about that. Thanks. Thanks. You. Thank you, Dr. Rude, and for the plug. And I think it's, am I correct that the tweets can come from anybody, parents, children, community member, anybody who yeah, wants to plug for Cherry Hill getting fair funding again? Right. One of the things that I was maybe disheartened by is, is the committee was saying that the legislators don't necessarily always want to hear from admin and board members. They get bored with that. Um, but hearing from constituents, hearing from students that goes from the taxpayers, that goes a really long way with legislators. So it's really important, you know, we can sit here at this table and talk about, you know, what we want to do for fair funding, but what we really need is we need our community members to really get out there and talk to their legislators and, and make a case for, you know, and make a push for why Cherry Hill, you know, needs more funding um, from the state and, and, let me just say that in a, in a different way. We need more of our tax dollars to come back to us in Cherry Hill. So that. Well said. <laughs> Thank you. Other uh, uh, board member correspondence, Mrs. Gallagher. Um, last Wednesday, Mrs. Fleischer and I, and I brought my children and husband along to um, Kingston's mindfulness night. Um, it was a really fun night where um the teachers and staff discussed how, um, you know, stress impacts your brain, different ways of kind of calming yourself down through breathing, coloring, yoga, kind of like shaking your sillies out. Um, my daughter's made a, 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 I think it's called a breathing stick. Mrs. Fleischer has it. And the next day I said my husband should have made one too, but um, he didn't. <laughs> Dr. Malash was there. It was nice to, um, to, to talk to him and, and Dr. Marble. And it was a, uh, it was a fun night and it was well attended. And I was really happy that it was an event that um, I could drag my family to. So thanks. 
Thank you. Great. Mrs. Fleischer. Yes, so I will add with Mrs. Um, Gallagher, it was great to meet her whole family. Actually, it was a wonderful family event and Dr. Malash um, showed up too. I did bring my uh, my breathing stick. No offense to anybody here for needing it tonight. I'm just saying, if you see me using it, um, but <laughs> I actually, in my real life, um, I actually teach meditation, stress management, and different um, holistic health uh, modalities for uh, some of the... Um, the health systems and for different nonprofits. So this is really something that is such, um, you know, a passion of mine and to see it in the school and they did such an amazing job. Dr. Marble, Mrs. Lentanzio, did I say her name right? Lentanzio um, was um, all the teachers were amazing. They all came together and did such great did. work. That it was really great. So this little breathing stick, what you do is you just take, they have the kids take deep breaths and then you move like a little beat. So you can use it at any time. So you take five, there's five on this. So you can do that. The other thing I learned, and this is, I've been doing this for like 20 years, and this is fun. I normally don't do it with all little kids is you can like breathe in and out and just follow your fingers. Mm. It's like the fingers. So when you see the little kids going like this, I was like, why are they doing this? And they're like, just have them, they sit down and they have them breathe in and out and follow slowly on their fingers. Really amazing. Like very simple. You don't need even a breathing stick. So it's great. <laughs> um, so that was very fun. And then the other thing that I did was um, my second um, governance um for uh, finance, which is the second year for board of ed members that um, it's mandated training that we have to do. So I did do, um, and check that one off to get that done. A second year is finance. So um, that was great. It was an online thing. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Other uh, board member correspondence? Mr. Mayor. A uh, few, first, um, first was uh, yesterday, I had an opportunity to meet um, or attend a meeting of the bond construction uh, teams, uh, the principals um, of the of the teams that are putting together all of our bond projects. Meet monthly. Uh, there's a meeting yesterday, an update on where uh, projects stand right now, and really very very positive. Um, they've they've done a lot of work, really, in scoping out what can be done, uh, what can be done. Um, efficiently and quickly, um, just to give you a, just a brief overview of, of some of the programs and some of the bid packages that are going out as early as next week for bid. Um, the roofing work at um, East, Russell, Knight, Cooper, and Sharp, and that'll be followed just a couple of weeks later with the bid package for West, Barton, Kilmer, and uh, Kingston, and that'll be followed also with a third uh, roofing package for Beck and and Woodcrest, and um, they've really put a lot of thought into ensuring that the um, all of the work is going to be done as efficiently as possible um, with sourcing of, of materials and also uh, taking advantage of economies of scale wherever possible. Um, so they're they're on an, a very aggressive um, an aggressive time schedule, but that's what we want, uh, and they really have been thinking out of the box. And working together in conjunction with the building principal. This is true of all the projects at all the schools, because it's the building principals that really, you know, they have their finger on the pulse of what's happening in the schools and how to better communicate to the parents uh, and students and making preparations to minimize disruptions. Of course, there are going to be some um, throughout this process. Um, so they're they're in constant communication with them, and, and that was good to hear as well. Um, some of the other bid uh, packages that are going out, um, and all of them are going to be going out at some point by the end of the year also uh, include the stadium work at uh, Cherry Hill East, that, that would be the lighting um, and also um, the new stands. The um, packages for playgrounds at Hart and Payne. Also the HVAC work at Cherry Hill West, the um, asbestos um, work and roofing at uh, at Carusi, and by the way, anytime we met, they, they've mentioned they made a, you know, this is very important to them as it should be. Um, anything dealing with um, environmental and asbestos abatement in particular is always done um, in the summers when the students are not present because, of course, the of the dangers that are involved there. And a lot of thought has to be, has to go into logistically um, how to handle that um, in, in order to make sure that. Uh, the students are always safe. Staff will always be safe when they come back into the buildings. And of course, the workers themselves uh, are safe during that work. Um, similarly, flooring at Rosa, 
um, there's asbestos in those tiles. There is some asbestos in some of the tiling and in some of the adhesive materials that are used in some of the walls. So that also has to be remediated. Um, and then of course, um, the six APRs. So work is going to continue, work will commence um, as early as this summer on the APRs. That's gonna also be as they described it, sort of like a rolling project where, where teams are gonna go from one to the next. So there will always be work done at each of the sites um, from one section to the next also being able to take advantage of economies of scale. Um, the other point that we talked about briefly, but it's important, um, is the uh, that we wanna be able to communicate the work that's being done um, in a way that is um, easily accessible to the community, but be as public facing as possible. I mean, obviously a lot of money went into these projects um, and we wanna be able to communicate that uh, and do it effectively. So we talked about some uh, some opportunities to start moving in, the, in that direction as well. Um, as these meetings commence, we're going to have them at least monthly. There'll be some more detail. And, and, and when the time is right, we're probably going to ask um, our, um, our teams, especially uh, Garrison, to come in and make, maybe make a presentation to the board, have an opportunity uh, to engage as well. So that, that was a great meeting. Um, and uh, Ms. Stern was also there as well. So uh, perhaps you have some additional comments about that. Other two things that um, I was able to do um, yesterday as well, last night, had a chance to attend the East-West Swim Meet. Um, great, again, always great to see the kids having so much fun, um, enjoying themselves, enjoying the camaraderie, enjoying the competition. Um, didn't matter so much, really. The, it seemed from, the, from, from their reactions, winning, losing, wasn't, it was important, it was important but they were all there together. There was, there was just a, a great, a great spirit. Um, wonderful to be in the room with them. My only um, concern is having having a daughter who's managing um, one of the teams that it might be nice if the boys went back to the 1950s, like full body suits, not, you know, those little speedos. It's a little issue with that, but, you know, it's probably not on the cards. Um, I also had an opportunity. <laughs> also had an opportunity. Uh, that's definitely on track. An opportunity to attend um, the Cherry Hill West open house uh, with Ms. Winters. What would struck me uh, most was one of the was the parent comment in in the opening presentation, who really brought home the the feeling of of West as a community, as preparing students for what's next, um, and it and it really confirmed for me at least as a parent, um, you know why I was so uh, so happy and supportive of all three of our kids when they chose uh, to attend Cherry Hill West, um, and seeing all of the kids again, how excited they were to welcome the eighth graders to talk about the school, how prideful they were, um, all of the, the athletes are there to talk about their, their teams, um, the other students are there to talk about their clubs and other, inter under other uh, opportunities for kids to engage. Just, um, you know, now that we're finally back in full swing and getting the kids into school, uh, being, being um, at an opportunity like that was, uh, was wonderful to see. Thank you. Um, other board member correspondence? Um, so I'll just add to um, Mr. Mayor's comments about the meeting yesterday that we were at the construction, I, I just call it a bond construction meeting. I took five and a half pages of notes and the meeting was um, 50 minutes nonstop of one by one projects and information. And you gave a great, um, top line overview of some of the things that were mentioned. There was so much more. So there's just a lot more of that to come and we'll continue to, um, you know, be involved with that, have reports to BNF, et cetera. Um, so very excited, uh, very, very intense, but very exciting. Um, and uh, I only attended officially one event <laughs> in the past two weeks, which was I'm, I'm, I've got to up my game a little bit here, um, which I plan to, but uh, I did go to the um, high school course of study night that was held at Beck. Um, despite having three children who have now been through or in high school, I have never actually attended one in person um, because uh, my oldest son, um, uh, we, we did his high school, we planned his high school courses in his IEP meeting and my other kids, um, the uh, course of study was virtual because it was during the pandemic. So it was actually really exciting. Um, there were a ton of staff people there, a packed room of parents and students and a ton of staff people, like way more than I would have 
realized would be there. It was a great night, very interesting, informative. Um, so it's nice to see the the level of energy that people are feeling about, um, you know, these kids planning to go next year to high school. Okay, so um, Ms. Elmore Stratton, went to front to bring it home for us. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to add, um, I, I know that several of us may have even participated or saw um, some of the events that took place for MLK Day from the various schools, and they really did a great job with um, highlighting and celebrating his legacy. Uh, and and so I, I didn't get to go to any, but I certainly retweeted and, and shared and liked um, at the reluctance of my son wanting me to do that, but um, I just wanted to say great job to all of them and also uh, happy new year to our students that are celebrating from the Chinese community. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, we move on to student reports and we get to start with, for our student reps, um, Aiden from East High School first, and then Liz will go next from West. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will provide an update for the past month for Cherry Hill High School East. Very brief update. Um, most things just going as usual. Um, not that that's not important, but, um, you know, many of our activities, sports continuing to progress as is typical. Um, the semester is coming to an end, so students will be starting new courses, and uh, that brings me to the probably biggest update in terms of policy and um, uh, student voice, or in this case, teacher voice, taking place at East, where um, there will be a change to the way study halls are administered, which will affect many students at East. Um, currently, study halls are housed in the cafeterias and the library annex, um, however, Teachers had voiced to administration repeatedly that um, this was a problematic system and that uh, it was very difficult to manage the study halls, uh, made it easier for students to not show up uh, in these large spaces. So um, administrators have figured out a way to clear enough classrooms to house all or almost all of the study halls. So that will be a change. And uh, Dr. Perry, our principal, has been making repeated announcements over the loudspeaker to remind students uh, not only of their new study hall locations, but also of new class locations for uh, semester long courses that will be changing over next week. Um, and this weekend, before that takes place, uh, East is hosting a big robotics competition. I say big because um, I was asking whether it was a state competition, a regional competition. I was told different things. Um, so we decided we're just going to call it a big robotics competition. Um, very, very exciting either way. Um, and next Saturday, a week from this coming Saturday, uh, there will be a regional acapella competition. That one is definitely regional. Um, and I guess I'm going a bit out of order. Sorry, skipped over this. But before this weekend, uh, on Thursday, so two days from now, uh, the open house dubbed Discover East uh, will take place. Um, some very nice branding we have going on for our um, new open house format, uh, where there was an online open house last week focusing on academics, and there will be an in-person open house on Thursday called Discover East focused on activities and electives. So uh, many teachers will be there from elective courses and different departments. There'll be performances from student groups. Uh, there will be a parent panel for uh, discussion um, and like Q&A with parents. And um, I believe every club or almost every club at East will have some kind of table or demonstration. Um, I heard that last year there were uh, debates going on with the debate team that were chess matches being played so it should be an exciting event um and that will lead into um our new class coming to east next year which will also involve their course selection course selection meetings have taken place uh in the past couple of weeks and those students now have until february to pick a High school and then decide on their courses. Um, so that is all the updates from East. The one other thing I did want to mention for students at East is that on February 7th, two weeks from today, on a Tuesday, um, 
I and Vivian, our alternate student representative, will be holding a uh, student town hall for any students who want to come and discuss issues with us that we will then um, take to the board. Um, so we encourage students who are listening to join us at that February 7th in room FO87. Um, and there's also uh, a smaller town hall uh, that Liz and I will both be part of coming up uh, on the 31st. So lots of opportunities for student voice, student engagement. Um, we had the instance of teacher voice being uh, leading to a positive change. So lots of uh, community working together to make all of these improvements at East over the past month. Thank you. Great, thank you, Aiden. And we'll move on to Liz. Hi, um, so in school news, we also a very brief um, report. Again, everything is going on in business as usual. So there are some few things that I do want to highlight. So in school news, we have a new lunch and learn schedule, which has been implemented in the school, which has allowed students to find more homeroom options during both lunch periods and receive extra help whenever needed. So for this lunch and learn schedule, students will be required to be in their selected homeroom within 15 minutes of the bell. And this means if they want to grab lunch and go, they have 15 minutes, which I have seen that is plenty of time for students to go through the lunch lines and grab their lunch. And then students are expected to remain in their location for the entire time of the LB or homeroom. They will be able to move at the bell at 1055 and remain at that space for the entire time. And students are only allowed to take one lunch. They cannot remain in the cafeteria and or gym for the full hour. And it is a lot easier to access science, math, and English teachers now with the new schedule. So we use the six-day repeating schedule in order to map this out. The first four days, um, specific teachers are available for extra help. And then they swap for days five and six, and then it keeps going on. So for West Senior Trip, the payments are passed too. Of course, you can always contact Ms. Roscoff or Ms. Takis for more information for any senior parents or senior students that are listening to this right now. And then one of the big things that I've heard throughout tonight is that we had our West 8th grade open house last week on January 18th, and we loved meeting our prospective new students. I myself was running around at the National Honor Society table, the track table, the computer science table. I was kind of all over. I even got to pet some starfish. So I thought that was really cool. <laughs> In athletics, the West Girls swim team just became division champs and they have a record of seven to one at the moment. And they did have uh, West versus East swim last night. And I've heard that that was a very fun event. In fact, I start regretting not doing swim when I was five years old <laughs> when I saw the pictures yesterday. Um, Winter Track just attended the state relay championships on January 15th, and they will be attending conference championships on this Friday, January 25th. And then Bowling Senior Day was yesterday, January 23rd, and registration for spring sports is currently open on Genesis. Physicals and paperwork should be submitted to the nurse. And for academics, we have the sealed by literacy and ASVAB testing that took place this past week, which has allowed students to pass their sealed by literacy in many languages. And again, as Aiden did say, a new semester, so it's time for new classes, new study halls, and new changes. And the and National Honor Society induction is being held on Thursday, January 26th. And Decker Regionals took place on January 9th, and many will be competing at the state competition on February 27th to March 1st at Haraz Hotel in Atlantic City, hoping to take more competitors to nationals in Orlando, Florida. And in the arts, the West Marching Band brought their magical mystery tour to Rosa and Kilmer on Wednesday, January 11th, and Broadway Night, Broadway Night will be held at the end of February. Thank you, Liz. That's a lot. That's great. And we actually have a third report, which I um, neglected to mention, which is from our uh, Coles Alternative High School, and it's a video report. So if we could. Hi, already... my name is Justin, <laughs> and I am in 11th grade at Alternative High School, Student Spotlight, Most Improved Growth Mindset. This student has successfully made 
individual growth in the following areas of work complete completion attendance in classes attitude and behavior they have worked hard and preserved november awardee rain sanders december awardee Jaden caprati most improved school participation this student improved their overall attendance to school and, and to class they are using their coping skills and staying in class to complete all of their work november awardee michaela parsons december awardee davy simboni student of the month this student displays our core values of respect responsibility citizenship and service to others in and out of the classroom they have worked hard to achieve success in their academics behavior and attendance november awardee mackenzie ryers december awardee echo weeks thanksgiving lunch in on november 17th the arthur lewis building continues its annual thanksgiving luncheon after a three-year pause the the tables were decorated with tablecloths and centerpieces arranged by our wonderful students there were leaves on each table for the guests to write something that they are thankful for our superintendent dr malash gave a powerful speech about the alternative high school our principal miss g re read a fabulous speech written by mackenzie ryers before we began to eat the menu included thanksgiving favorites such as mashed potatoes cranberries sweet potatoes with marshmallows turkey gravy green bean casserole stuffing dinner dinner rolls with cinnamon sugar and more the newest addition to the luncheon was bingo there was prizes for the staff and students to pick from the wake up calf rough rough ruffle the dinner i mean the winner of our rough rough raffle was nurse barb thank you all who participated the school raised eighty dollars for supplies to our school store from this fundraiser the wake up calf pizza students made homemade pizza sample samples and surveyed the school to determine which types of pizza to offer for sale during lunchtime it has been a great success in the first month our students have made over 50 pizzas public transportation although this was corny mr coaster took some students on a scavenger hunt to par practice safe skills as a pedestrian he gave students four clues that ended at a wawa we earned ten dollar gift card at wawa which we split three ways we also went to the cherry hill mall with mr coaster and miss augustine they taught students how to take new jersey transit to get to the mall we learned how to plan and execute the trip on public transportation using websites or apps and practiced safe traffic skills as pedestrians it was a nice and quiet experience community service we accepted collections for pete's pantry up to december 22nd 2022 some students at the alternative high school will go to walmart on january 3rd to partner with students at cherry hill west to shop for blessing bag items winter spirit week 
Students at Alternative High School helped Miss Concroli to plan the Winter Spirit Week. During this week, December 19th through 23rd, students participated in wearing themed clothing to earn PBIS points. Students cut out paper, snowflakes, and used white paint markers to decorate the walls and windows of the school. Winter Games 2022. On December 23rd, 2022, the staff and students participated in the annual Winter Games there. Three teams participated. Bros, Mr. Holiday, Mr. Coaster, Patrick, Ross, and J Jaden Caprati. We, we slay. Miss Anderson, Mr. O, Chris Ev Evans, Arkin Wilson, and Rain Sanders, and a tiny Prancers, Miss Kelsey, Miss Katie, Madison, Woodley, Woolley, Dylan Floyd. Competitions include a snowball toss, finding a pair of socks in a sock mountain and relay race, a anthelon, and trivia. While, com while the competition was extremely close, the team of we slay won the trophy. Some things we are looking forward to in the future are field trips, bowling every Thursday, residency in collaboration with Perkins Center for the Artists. A viewing is going to help us create a mosaic in our courtyard. So thank you, Justin. I know this was a recorded um, presentation that was really great. So I really appreciate the report from Justin. Um, I do want to mention that Aiden and Liz, this is the end of the marking period, and we assume both of you have a lot of homework. <laughs> so um, if, if you need to leave, we really want to thank you for hanging around so long, and uh, we'll see you at the next meeting. So thank you. Okay. Uh, it is 830, and that means it is time to move on to our first public comment which I think people have been waiting for. So I'm happy we're here. Um, there will be two opportunities for public comment this evening. The first public comment session is for board action items only. So items 13 through 16 are on our agenda. Uh, there will be another public comment uh, section for any topic at the end of our meeting. If you are a student in the district, you may comment on any agenda item or anything at all uh, during this first public comment. Um, I ask that if you are a student and you are online, if you would kindly put an S after your name, that way I can tell that you're a student when I call on you. Um, and we will, um, we will start in just a moment. I just want to finish reading this long introduction. Um, we would ask that when you come to the podium to please identify, uh, if you're an adult, please identify the agenda item you're speaking about, your name and your, your municipality, clearly, which just is whatever town you live in doesn't need to be your home address. Um, we will alternate between speakers in the room and those online. Each speaker will be given a maximum of three minutes to speak, and the time on the screen will indicate and the screen will indicate the amount of time you have remaining. Cherry Hill is a community that values education, and educational topics often bring out a passionate response. The Cherry Hill Board of Education, a group of volunteers, <laughs> uh, supports a school climate in which our diversity is a source of strength and our all are included. Respect is foundational in how you, how you treat uh, one another, how we treat you, um, and how we support our administration and staff and their essential work. Please join us in practicing the utmost respect for all. Thank you. And with that, um, looks like we have a student who might need to move the microphone all the way down if possible. Uh, Miss, Mr. Yes. Uh, okay, there we go. Pull it out if you would like. Thank you. And uh, if you would just say your. She can see the board. I don't think she wants to. Oh, she doesn't want she to. She would be better here. Uh, okay. You don't want to. Thank you. If you want to just state your your name and you just read your paper. first name if you'd like only. Hello, my name is Shalom Gary. Okay, hold on. 
I've had three principals and only two that have stayed for half a year. And this is one of them, Dr. Hogan, and I don't like that. He has to leave. And I have to have a new principal that I do not want to have. And I do not want to have that much. That much. And I'm in first grade. And I am in first grade. And at the end of the year. And at the end of the year. I have had four principals for elementary school. I will have had four principals. Four principals for elementary school. For elementary school. Thank you, Shulamit. Hi, my name is Shoshana Yerse, and I am a third grade student at Joyce Kilmer Elementary School. I am sick of having too many principals in four years of school. I it want just one principal and stick with it. I'm going to miss Miss Dr. Hogan. Can, and can we continue with Wildcat Wednesday? Thank you. Thank you, Shoshana. Hi, I'm a Yoha Yer, a student at George Kilmer Elementary School, fifth grade, Mr. Jankaitis class, on the topic of Dr. Hogan leaving. This will be my fifth principal at Kilmer after he left. And uh, having a principal that I barely even know at the moving up ceremony would be very stressful for me. So I was wondering if Dr. Malash could come. Thank you, Yoha. I'm I'm sorry. I I just I realize we want to give kids all the right. I just want to check online and make sure there's no kids online because we do like to alter, alternate. So, um, I don't see any hands of any anybody identify with an S. Um, so if you're a student online and you want to speak, please put an S after your name. And I'm um I'm not seeing one, so we'll continue with the students in the room. Hi, I'm Annabeth John from Cherry Hill. I am third grade at Chill Kilmer, and I would like to talk about agenda item 15.1. I don't like each year I have a different principal since I've been in kindergarten. I have had four principals. I think that's crazy. I just want one principal that would stay until I am in fifth grade. Even if it's a new principal, I still want them to do a Wildcat Wednesdays and Wildcat Families and Wildcat Rallies. I like to have the I like to have the principal at fun things we do with our PTA. It is fun to see our principal at skate night. If you you did a good job finding Dr. Hogan, so please do it again and find us another good one. We going to miss him a lot. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> Thank you. I think that might be all of our students who came in from Kilmer. Um, and I want to thank you all for being so, so brave and speaking so beautifully. And I also want to let all of you know, I too am really sad Dr. Hogan's leaving. So I just want to mention that. And uh, we're going to work really hard. We're gonna li we listened to everything you said. We took notes and we're going to listen to um, see what we can do to, to be able to make sure it's as easy as possible to get through this. Okay. Okay. 
All right, so thank you. No other students online, no other students in the room. And we will go to the next public comment, which is online. And um, the name is Sherry. And Sherry, if you could please state your name, your municipality and the um, board action item that you are speaking to tonight. Thank you. Yeah, if you, Sherry, if you could please unmute. Looks like Sherry, you lowered your hand. Um, so we'll go back to the room. If there's anybody in the room who would like to make a public comment regarding a board action item, <clears throat> just the usual name and municipality. Thank you. Hi, I am Christy Vedron. I am from Cherry Hill and I'm speaking about agenda item 15.1. Um, I'm the president of uh, Kilmer's PTA. Before I start, I would like to thank Dr. Hogan for his service. We support this difficult decision and we will truly miss him. First, I would like to speak from a PTA perspective. Um, I am telling the board during their for their search for an interim principal how critical it is to have someone to have as much enthusiasm and school spirit that Dr. Hogan has brought back into our building. As a president, I need a principal who will be able to encourage um, families and students to attend PTA events by being present at those events as well. I need a president, a principal who will encourage our staff members to be involved as well. Um, and it's very difficult to run a PTA without a principal's encouragement and support. Now, as a parent, I would like to make the following statements pleading for consistency in this school. In the past nine years, Joyce Kilmer has been through nine principals. It has created a lot of chaos and uncertainty in our school and is affecting our students and our families. When a new principal comes in, there is a time of transition where a relationship of trust, trust needs to be developed. We have not had that chance in the four years that I have been there to establish that amount of trust. As a parent, I am pleading with the board to find us an interim principal from the district uh, who will support and effectively train yet another principal. I'm also asking for the possibility of having an experienced assistant principal in our building. I feel having two administrators will ease the heavy burden of one principal and may create a more supportive team. Having nine principals makes our school look very unreliable and very undesirable to any incoming principals looking for employment. And it also deters prospective families from choosing Joyce Kilmer. I'm begging you to do whatever you need to do to make our reputation better and help our staff and students establish a consistent, supportive and reliable environment. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And we will go back online. Um, and uh, this is going to be again to please state your name municipality and the item on the agenda you're speaking to. Uh, and it looks like uh, Panina Mintz uh, is the next hand online. Uh, Dr. Panina Mintz, Cherry Hill, thank you for taking my call. I'd like the board to uh, not approve item 13.1, 14.4, and 14.5. Uh, there's no need to spend taxpayers' dollars on these items. Thank you. Okay, we come back to the room. I think you might know what to do. So. Alana Yaris, Cherry Hill. I'm speaking to agenda item 15.1. Um, I sent an email with most of my thoughts about the Joyce Kilmer principal. Just in case you haven't read it, board, please take a look at the long email. Um, I agree with my children and my friends who I rallied to come to speak about Dr. Hogan leaving. We're sad that he's leaving. I have a long time at Joyce Kilmer with six children. Um, I implore the board to please hire an interim and the administration to please hire an interim principal who's invested in the district, maybe an interim principal who will immediately turn into the full-time principal at Kilmer so that although there will be transition in March, there will not then be transition again in September. Um, it's very important to me that there's consistency for my children. And as Dr. Mahan stated earlier, that if um, the teacher has a hard time teaching children for 
uh, test scores. Um, if there's chaos at the top with administration, it's hard. It's a hard learning environment for students to learn in as well. Um, last time when you were looking for a principal when Dr. Rick stepped down, I stated that I wanted a principal that would stay long term, and I still want a principal that will stay long term. And I just need someone who will create consistency for my children so that when they go to school every day, they know that they have someone who's in their corner besides their teacher. They have the administration. They know that their parents are in their corner. It's been a hard year for them, and they just need that consistency so that they can be successful in school. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any more hands online. Uh, any other people in the room who'd like to speak? Okay, so if you just state your name, municipality, and the action item you're speaking about. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nikki Dobrova. I'm the corresponding secretary of Kilmer PTA, and I'm a resident of Cherry Hill. I'm speaking about agenda item 15.1. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Hogan for his time serving as our principal. He has been a positive figure with a welcoming smile for everyone, and he will be missed. I have been a parent at Kilmer since uh, the 2012-2013 school year, and there's been a revolving door of principals since then. At this point, it's clear to see that this is an ongoing problem, a festering issue. We have a wonderful staff, and they, as well as our Kilmer Wildcats and families, deserve a stable administration. I implore you to employ an interim principal that is already familiar with our district and able to handle the transition smoothly. Pardon me, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> and also to take into consideration to allow for two administrators in our building to distribute the responsibilities evenly so that the new incoming principal will not be overwhelmed and the revolving door can finally stop spinning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brova. Okay, there is a hand online. We'll go to the um, line next. Um, Beth Becker, uh, you're next. And if you could please um, uh, just besides your name and municipality, state the item you are commenting on on our uh, action item agenda. Yeah, um, Beth Becker, Cherry Hill, 15.1. Um, I understand there's been um, high principal turnover all over. My older child had three in their six years at Stockton. Uh, a parent just told me their older child had four during their six years at Woodcrest. But what's happening at Kilmer is completely something else. And I, um, you know, one or two uh, principals who had to leave for personal reasons, um, you know, that's that's totally understandable. But nine principals in nine years, there's got to be uh, something else happening, right? Whether it's um, I don't know, a cultural issue, like a school culture issue. I uh, I have no idea what it is, but I trust the district can get to the bottom of it um, and figure out uh, what is happening um, over there. Uh, the other thing was I implore the district to listen to the parents of Kilmer, also um, maybe hire within the district. Um, I think someone, already within the district will have less of a learning curve, um, understand the culture of Cherry Hill and will be less likely to move on to another position, um, be more likely to stick with Kilmer um, and give those parents and more importantly, those students, um, the continuity and stability that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, we'll go back to the room. Dr. Yoni Irish, Cherry Hill, continuing on the Kilmer Parade for 15.1. One, out of tremendous respect, Dr. Hogan brought in energy that I hope to achieve and others hope to achieve. You come into that school, he's running at 200 miles per hour at every moment and every day. Um, that absence will be felt on the first day back when he's not there. Um, I was here when Betsy McHuster was appointed as interim principal. I was here when Kirk was appointed. It's We're tired. It's been an exhausting process. As someone who was in this district, as a student growing up, I had two principals at Sharp. And uh, that was seen as a lot then. 
imagine the amount of turnover and what it goes on to build those relationships with a parent. You know you've got a partner at that office to go and talk to. I will share that Dr. Hogan, did, well, Lasting Legacy will be there. His hires this year were absolutely amazing. We're really fortunate they brought Ms. O'Neill on as our counselor to really help support our children and found one of the most amazing counselors I've ever seen come in and just run with it. And we're fortunate to have her supporting our children, but we're just tired. It's exhausting post-pandemic being an elementary school parent. I did not think when we've had six children that we potentially have six or seven or eight principles during our time. It just it needs to end. We're here to partner with you and support you. Um, I should not have a, my daughter turn to me at a dinner saying like, I wonder who my second grade principal is going to be. It shouldn't be funny. Um, and we shouldn't be laughing about that. And it's really stressful for us to then feel than lying to our child when we said, oh, it'll be this one. And to then turn back last night at dinner and be like, we have to have a hard conversation with you guys. It's really challenging. And you know how much my family believes in this and how much we support. We really want something to happen, especially in terms of come from within someone who loves and breathes Cherry Hill. Betsy did that when she was there. She was my principal at East and she came in for that one year and she stopped the bleeding. A lot of use a lousy term for that. She came with a passion. She was there. She was present and really made that work and was an excellent tradition to Dr. Rick when he came in. When Dr. Rick volunteered to move over from pain where he was in a steady position to come to Kilmer, that mattered. We need that to happen again, and please help us do that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, still nobody else on the line, so looks like we have the podium. Uh, Jen Nadio, Cherry Hill, uh, number 16.2. The proposed move further segregates the middle schools, both racially and economically. Is this board going to allow history to repeat itself? The district has already been cited in the past for segregation, and this will put the district in jeopardy of another violation. Knight to Rosa puts the enrollment in the 92 to 95 percentile to capacity overcrowding the school that raises concerns that they would not be able to expand the programs for special ed and risk having to move our programs to Beck and Crucy. As far as 15.1, please make sure that you get someone who's going to help these children grow. I remember uh, one of my sons had a, had a split. There was a principal and then there was another principal who came in. And I remember him saying to me, I really liked my other principal, but I feel great about this one. And he was lucky enough to keep that principal. We're not doing that in, in this school, and that has to stop. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is a hand up on, on the line, and that is uh, Bonnie Yarez. If you could please state your name, uh, municipality, and the item you're speaking on on our agenda tonight. Okay. I believe it's 15. I lost track here. I'm calling as a former parent to Kilmer, a grandparent to Kilmer, and a resident of Cherry Hill, for 44 years. It's been at least 34 years that Kilmer has had a revolving door of principles. It, it's got to stop. I know that in the early 90s, uh, they transferred Cy Wallach out of administration and put him in Kilmer. And I know the parents there begged to keep him. And I think he stayed on for an extra year or two. We need somebody of high quality, committed to the school. I don't know what else to say. Years ago when my kids were in school, we had the problem that principal stayed too long. Kilmer's got the problem of having a revolving door on Chapel Avenue. Please, for the sense of community, for the kids, the parents, please hire somebody that is going to stay. I understand there are things that happen, but we need somebody that has a commitment that is going to keep the kids and everybody happy. Uh, maybe from within the system, like Dr. Kirk had been transferred, but please give it this your utmost uh, priority. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll come back to the room. A lot of people who know what to do with the microphones. <laughs> Jim Neary, Cherry Hill. I'm reading on item 16.2. Good evening. Tonight as a board, you're expected to vote on item 16.2 to finalize the changes in the proposal to middle school redistricting. The administration is playing a shell game, 
with you, presenting buckets of numbers and asking you to pick a cup. Just a few weeks ago, they suddenly changed their recommendations, stating that Carusi would not be able to house the student volume at night. They're trying to keep the, vo the focus on reactionary changes, while in parallel, they're calling a halt to the real problem, which is elementary school redistricting. We need leadership to do the hard work and to find a proactive solution to solve the student numbers that are being fed up to our middle schools. The original plan that was in place currently has year one with Carusi at 79% to capacity and Rosa at 83% to capacity. That's next year. With the new plan, year one, Carusi would be at 72 capacity, but Rosa is going to be at 93% to capacity, but we can't house them all at Carusi. Year three of the original plan has Carusi at 92% to capacity and Rosa down to 67. Year three of the new plan has Carusi at 73% capacity and Rosa at 95% to capacity. That is greatly gonna restrict the ability to have programs of all varieties at that school. And again, the administration is telling you, we can't have night at Carusi because it's going to overcrowd the school. It's too much. This new plan is putting Rosa at a significant higher capacity day one. Regardless of how you vote on this this evening, these changes have stirred up the community. There's great controversies being talked about, but you need to ask yourself why. Why is the community that you're serving so upset about which of the three middle schools their children are going to? Because it makes a difference. First, we need to start looking at why there are disparities in culture, climate, and educational outcomes across the three middle schools. We wouldn't care what school our children were in if they were all the same opportunities and outcomes at each building. This is a top-down issue that is continually scapegoated to the building level when questions are raised. We are a district of schools, a school district. We shouldn't have franchises. We should have a Cherry Hill education being a Cherry Hill education. Our superintendent is responsible for running the schools well and ensuring opportunity and outcome from each school. Every year we're seeing disparities growing year over year. As the board, it is your responsibility to oversee Dr. Malosh to make sure he's running those schools well. Thank you. Please think Thank you, it. Mr. Neer. Okay, I'll look online. No hands up online. So we go back to the room. And if you could please state your name, your, your municipality and the item you're speaking on. Good evening, Amanda Greenstein, Cherry Hill, 16.2. Um, Last meeting uh, two weeks ago, I spoke about the middle school redistricting and how I feel that's going to affect not only Carusi, but then West, because that would be the next step after middle school. Tonight, I guess this also feeds into 15.1, hearing those students talk, it shows me how the resources are not spread out evenly in this school district. How one side of town, as I said previously, for 20 plus of my years that I've was a student in the school district, that's been the glaring disparity. I don't know if as not only a board and an administration, it's something that you guys feed off of, but I'm sick of it. I've lived it. I don't want my children to live it. I lived it at the high school level. My children aren't there yet. I have a kindergartner and I have a fourth grader who, full disclosure, I am attending the Resurrection Open House, which I never thought I would when I bought my house. Um, to see if that's a better fit for my fourth grader. Um, it needs to end. You have a school, you have children that have gone through nine principals in nine years. You, there, somebody's not doing their job to a section of schools on one side of town. It's glaring. It's obvious. We all see it. We all, the West side, we feel it and we don't want to feel it anymore. And like Jim just said, Beth Becker has said, Ms. Um, Nadio has said, you're going to take a school and put it and put Rose at 94, 93% capacity to put ARC there because that's what their parents want. I guess the loudest ones get the worm. I don't know, but it's doing, you're going to take one neighborhood and make them happy and put everybody else 
a, a discourse, it's, it's not fair. You guys aren't thinking about this from anywhere else, but where you're sitting and you need to think about the people it's affecting. If my kids, if I was a Kilmer parent, I would have, my house would have been up for sale and I would have been out of this town. I, I, I don't even know how they, those parents are doing this because it, it's disgusting to me. And somebody needs to give the, uh, Kilmer is your worst performing school in this whole entire district. Somebody needs to give the resources where they need to go. I don't want to hear you can't give to one side of town because the east side is going to complain. That's that's a poor excuse. You need to give help where it needs to go. This should be a school district where all of our schools are achieving and competing and producing at the same level, not picking our and choosing based on who sits on the board or what side of town we live on. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I look online. No more hands are raised. Again, so I go back to the room. Um, if there's anyone who'd like to speak, please approach the podium. Hello, uh, good evening. My name is Ann Barassi and I reside in Cherry Hill. I'm speaking on action item 16.2, uh, in the current redistricting plan. Um, a Russell Knight, after research and looking at data, has a grade school rating of seven out of 10 and a US News World Report ranking of 100th in the state. All their setting schools to Caruzzi are at best four out of 10, and are ranked at best 504th out of all elementary schools in the state. These ratings include the percentage of low-income students per school and a student-teacher rate ratio, among other data. ARK is the third best rated elementary school in our town. The two others will be sent to Beck in the fall. This decision moves a large majority of above-average students to Beck and Rosa instead of distributing them equally throughout the district. We have heard from one parent how crowded Russell Knight is, and they do have the highest student-teacher ratio of all schools that send a cruzy. However, they perform the best by far. They are well above average. Payne, Kilmer, Barton, Kingston all have student-teacher ratios of 11, 12, or 13 to 1. They've been performing consistently just average or below average. Cruzy itself is already stated to have an 11 to 1 student-teacher ratio. That's a very favorable favorable ratio. The disparity between schools is in the economically disadvantaged population. Two schools, Claire Barton and Joyce Kilmer, that send to Caruzzi have over a 20% economically disadvantaged population, while ARK's ranges from 3 to 5%. The students from Russell Knight would provide a balance in the classroom that is so desperately needed. Redistricting Clara Barton or ARK at the elementary level would have alleviated the crowding at Caruzzi and Rosa, um, but kept the economic balance. You chose not to do that. I have been searching for a reason why it would benefit Cherry Hill Public Schools to have one incredibly low performing middle school compared to the other two. The district stated goal is student wellness, create frameworks of learning and support for all students to develop the skills needed for social and emotional wellness. How does creating a large socioeconomic gap between the east and the west side of town support all students. You are creating an environment where friendly, healthy competition will be unlikely. You are creating what appears to be a culture of the haves and the have-nots due during a crucial stage of social and emotional development. I have heard it stated many times from different school employees that if I want my child to be able to succeed at Cherry Hill East, they need to attend Beck or Rosa. What is the district's plan in three years when all students from Rosa and Beck choose East? What is your plan if Rosa becomes overcrowded in the next three years? What is your plan if Caruzzi's ratings continue to fall? Dr. Malash mentioned that not all special programs will be available at each middle school. Which special programs are moving? Where are they moving to? I assume since Rosa will be almost at capacity that they will have very few, if any, special programs. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I look online, don't see any hands again. So I go back to the room if there's anyone who'd like to speak. Laurie Neary, Cherry Hill. I'm speaking on 15.1 and 16.2. My heart is breaking for those students at Joyce Kilmer. Um, as many have stated, a few here or there. That's astronomical. That's a problem. That's a screaming problem. That's not this one's leaving for that reason. You have a serious issue that has to get addressed. The children are not supported. The outcomes are not equitable. They are not the same. What does this look like for the students at Kilmer when they get to Carusi, when they get to West? What do you think that carries through? How does that appear? What do their outcomes look like? I don't know, but I can tell you nine different leaders in a building 
does not bode well for our students? How can they possibly perform? For 16.2, these things are not separate. They are inextricably linked. What happens at 16.2, I said before, I knew this was an inevitable outcome in December. It is a marathon and not a sprint. The next couple of months will not be fun. I do not envy the position of anyone on the board. I have been there. Many of you know that. This is not fun. You are not being presented great options. And quite frankly, I looked at the math. I don't know where the fire was. The difference that prompted this, oh my gosh, we have to act now. Have to move, change everything out of nowhere come December. 28 students at Carusi. You're actually down 87 students from what was proposed in March or February of 2022. The distribution is different amongst the middle schools. And it looks really shocking when it is shown as it is. But the actual data, it was known when it was selected in February of 22 that it was going to be less at Beck and Rosa and it would be higher at Carusi. But they have a much better teacher to student ratio, ratio and a larger building capacity. So where's the fire that drives this? I don't have the answer to that. We'll get an answer eventually. Something has to be done. I made my sons a promise. My husband made them a promise. We leave no one behind when he transferred from west to east, and we are not leaving anyone behind. There is a real problem. It has to be fixed. This is not going to fix it. There is a long standing issue of educational segregation and isolation for over 30 years in this town. And it will come to an end. It won't come to an end tonight. It will take many months and many years. That is the measure of our resolve to fix this. It is an injustice to the family sitting on the west side and it has to come to an end. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I look back online. Again, no hands, so back to the room. Anyone would like to approach the podium and speak at the podium? Lots of people who know what to do. <laughs> Don't forget the item, Rick. <laughs> yeah, 16.2. Middle school redistricting. My name is Rick Short, Cherry Ho. Wow, congratulations. You done the equity, right? You made everyone equal, right? No, 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 you didn't. Nope, nope. You had a successful Rosa, but no, that's not equitable, right? So we have to get rid of Rosa. That's why we had to do middle school redistricting, right? We need equity. We need involved all the same. But guess what? You got another mess. You totally messed up. Before you had a lottery system when everything was fair, you know, everyone was fair to get into Rosa. Certain people liked Rosa, had more of the arts. Great, great for students. But congratulations. You made your bed. Now you got to live in it. Equity is destroying this town. And until people know that equity is just part of the diversity, equity, inclusion, the DEI is a bunch of baloney. So you made the bed. Now you got to live in it. Congratulations. Thank you, board. Okay. I have two hands on that are up online. So I'm going to go to the first one. Um, and I, you folks, if you've probably been hearing me say this, I'll just say it one more time. Uh, if you could please state your name, your municipality, and the um, action item agenda, action item agenda you're speaking about. And we'll go to Jessica Simpkins uh, first, if you could please unmute yourself. I'm sorry, Miriam, I did not intentionally raise my hand. I'm going to meet myself again. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. Okay, so we'll jump right to Pat McCargo, who's next with your hand up, if you could. Oh, Pat, hand up, hand down. If you'd like to speak, um, Ms. McCargo, uh, just unmute, go, go for it. Thank you. Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and I, too, want to speak on the action item 16.2 with the redistricting, and I know this is a really tough uh issue for the board it always has been but my concern is that the rhetoric that's going around is making it with racial overtones and that really upsets me and it makes west sound like it's a substandard school well i can assure you it is not because i've had four children come out of there i had grandchildren come out of there i have a granddaughter who's a senior there who is thriving and dr damon is doing a wonderful job there so you know all this stuff about the redistricting, I would suggest that the board do it carefully and not just listen to, to people who are getting upset because of what it may mean 
and using and throwing numbers at it. But the truth of the matter is, uh, if something has to be done, it has to be done. And sometimes we have to follow a, swallow a tough pill. But there are more than just uh, those two schools involved. You have a whole district involved. And what are you going to do when, when, when parents start screaming, I don't want my child over that school. I don't want my child over that school. Well, you'll never get anything done. So you might have to bite the bullet. I'm not saying that this is the be all, end all and a panacea for everything to be corrected. But what I will say is that it's a tough issue. And for people who are sitting in the audience throwing hands at this board, this is not the first board that's addressed this issue. And it will probably not be the last. So I hope you keep it in mind that they are volunteers and they have a vested interest in kids doing well as well. So with that, I'll just end my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we go back to the room. There's anybody else who would like to speak for public comment one? Going once, going twice. There's very few of you who haven't come to, <laughs> to the podium, so I guess, so that's fine. Uh, all right, I think we're done. We'll close public comment one, and we will now um, go to uh, superintendent's comments. Dr. Malash. Thank you, Ms. Stern. Uh, and I'll try to keep just some brief comments for this evening. First, to all who celebrated this past weekend, Happy Lunar New Year. Uh, I know a large portion of our community uh, partake in this celebration. There were some excellent displays uh, and lessons that took place uh, at a number of our schools from the preschool up through our high schools. I'm grateful to the number of families that came in um, to speak with students and speak with classes uh, about what Lunar New Year is and what Lunar New Year means. Um, so thank you to everyone and congratulations to everyone who has been celebrating. Uh, second, if you are watching uh, on the screen, you can see over my shoulder, over my head, and if you're in the room, you can see uh, there's a, a very large display that is a set of butterfly wings. So across the district, going back into late in the fall, uh, we've had schools that have been participating in a butterfly project. This Friday, January the 27th, is Holocaust Remembrance Day. And the butterfly project is something, it's an, it's an international activity. Uh, Ms. Allison Staffen, who's one of our curriculum supervisors, has worked with principals and teachers from across the district in preparing materials uh, as part of the butterfly, butterfly project. Uh, she has a presentation and some videos that are being put together that we will release on Friday. This large display, uh, these butterfly wings, these came from the Malberg Early Childhood Center. Uh, and when you get up close, you can see that each one of, uh, it actually looks like feathers or little petals that are on the wings. Uh, each one of them um, was made by tracing one of the student's shoes, and then the student painted the picture. Uh, you know, painted the paper before they were mounted. So it's absolutely beautiful. There are some displays that are out in the hallway as well, in the front showcase, uh, they'll be up. Um, we have worked with our partners through the JCRC, um, Helen Kirschbaum, who's the director of the Esther Robb Holocaust Museum and the Goodwin Education Center. She was here today to pick up some of the materials. They'll be displayed there. We'll also have materials that are being displayed at the Cherry Hill Library. So one of those, uh, you know, we talk in our district goals about connecting beyond the classroom, truly a connection uh, for so many of our students and families um, that connected in, in doing these projects. So I'm grateful to Ms. Staffen and all of the teachers and principals for the work that they did with their students. Our high school reps mentioned that the semester ends next Friday, January 27th, which means that the year academically is half over as of next Friday. Uh, it's going to be a veritable sprint between now and when graduation occurs um, on January the 9th, I'm sorry, on June the 19th uh, for our high school seniors. It's going to be a, a quick few months that we're going to go through. There are a lot of exciting activities. Uh, so if you have children who attend our middle schools or our high schools, please know that the marking period is going to end and the report cards will be coming out early in February. Dr. Mahan did a, a great plug. I'm going to mention it again. Kindergarten registration has begun for the 2023-2024 academic year. Uh, the way that the folks in the registration office have scheduled it, there is one full day here in the building for on-site reg registration for each of our elementary schools. There is information that's online. Please go on the website, look for the information. We have teams of people that are ready to go. You show up with your information. The registration goes very quickly. We are excited to get our kindergartners registered, especially our new kindergartners and new families to the district. Um, tell your neighbors if you're involved in a preschool program or something else or mom's groups, let people know. We really want people to register now. Get them registered so that we can appropriately staff at the schools. 
Um, we end up typically with a lot of folks that register at some point during the summer. Uh, it makes it challenging because of our class caps to be able to place all of the children at their home elementary school for kindergarten if they register late. So please get out and register. There were, uh, were Martin Luther King Day activities that took place throughout last week are taking place throughout this week as well. Uh, I'm grateful to, again, the teachers, the family members, the students, uh, and the schools uh, for all the different projects that went on. Mrs. Wilson and I actually got to spend some time over at Crucy Middle School last week where they were making uh, sandwiches. There were 75 students. There were 20 adults, nearly 100 people in that glass hallway, and they made about 1,000 sandwiches in less than an hour, I think, Mrs. Wilson, when, when we were there. Uh, it was incredible to hear the buzz of the, the kids and the adults working together and what they were preparing, talking about what they were doing. They understood the meaning of it. They understood the importance of it, being very careful with how they made the sandwiches because they knew that it was going to be an important meal uh, for somebody. Um, I am looking forward to, uh, Aiden mentioned it, the, the High School East is hosting a robotics competition. I'll put that information out to the board. You can also check the school website. There'll be information out about that. Uh, winter sports are winding up for post-season competitions. Uh, I was at the swim meet last evening. Uh, and as Mr. Mayor said, it's a great competition. Um, you know, the, the boys teams and the girls teams from high school East and West, uh, it was packed. It was standing room only. There were more people that were standing in the hallway to be able to watch. Swim is certainly alive and well in Cherry Hill. We're looking for all four of the teams to go on and to compete uh, in the state tournament. Same with our wrestling teams and our basketball teams. If you get a chance, uh, middle school sports, basketball and wrestling are going on as well. Go out to see those kids compete. Um, the musicals and plays are going to be coming up. There'll be more information that we'll have here at the board and on the district website. Special shout out to High School West uh, and to Mrs. or to Miss Liz Begley. Uh, High School West just were notified that they were receiving a special recognition from College Board, an AP recognition for closing the gender gap uh, in AP computer science. Uh, so Liz Begley is the one that initiated the the AP computer science program. Um, over at High School West, uh, and she has dramatically expanded it um, and has been recognized uh, along with some of our peers from across the country for closing the gender gap and having more female students involved uh, and doing well in that program. So thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, I think we're getting we're getting close. <laughs> 9.15, we're going to keep going. Uh, I'm going to, um, we're going to move on to our action agenda. I'm going to ask uh, Mrs. Winters to please uh, move the curriculum and instruction agenda. Thanks. The superintendent recommends and I move the following 13.1 approval of attendance at conference and workshops for the 22-23 school year. 13.2 approval of out of district student placement for 22-23 school year. 13.3, approval of summer programs for 2023, and 13.4, resolution for the award of settlement agreement. Do I have a second? Ms. Fleischer, are there any questions? Ms. Sugars, please open the vote. Okay, board members, the online voting is open. If you... Uh, have any abstentions or no votes, please let me know. Yes. I need to abstain from 13.4, please. But yes to the rest. Um. Mrs. Sugar, I need to abstain 13.1 and 13.4. And yes, there was. Thank you. Okay, other than the exceptions noted, we have a unanimous yes vote. Okay, thank you. And we move on to business and facilities. Mr. Meyer, could you please move the BNF agenda? Surely. <clears throat> the superintendent recommends that I move the following. Item 14.1, approval of minutes, special action meeting minutes, and executive session minutes, uh, dated December 6, 2022. 14.2, approval of minutes, <clears throat> regular meeting minutes, and executive session meetings, dated December 20, 2022. 14.3, financial reports. 14.4, resolution binding the Cherry Hill Public School District 
to purchase electric generation services through the Alliance for Competitive Energy Services <clears throat> Bid Cooperative Pricing System. <clears throat> Item 14.5, resolution binding, Cherry Hill Public School District to purchase natural gas services through the Alliance for Competitive Energy Services. And 14.6, resolution of the award of transportation. Finally, 14.7, Acceptance of donations. Do I have a second? Dr. Rood, are there any questions? Seeing none, Ms. Sugars, would you kindly open the voting? The online voting is open. If you have a no or a uh, abstention on a particular item, please let me know. Sugars? Yes. Yeah. I need to abstain from 14.1 and 14.2, I believe. I was going to say the same. Sugars, I also need to abstain from 14.2. Mr. Sugars, I need to abstain from uh, Jewish Family, uh, I'm sorry, Jewish Federation on the bill list to avoid a conflict of interest. Okay, other than the exceptions noted, we have a unanimous yes vote. Okay, and we move on to um, policy and legislation, I'm sorry, human resources. Um, uh, Ms. Elmar Stratton, could you uh, kindly move the HR agenda? Sure, and congratulations to Mrs. Begley on her award at Cherry Hill West. Uh, the superintendent recommends, and I move the following, 15.1, uh, termination of employment certificate. 15.2, termination of employment non-certificated. 15.3, appointment certificated. 15.4, appointments non-certificated. 15.5, leaves of absence certificated. 15.6, leaves of absence non-certificated. 15.7, assignment salary change non-certificated. 15.8, other compensation certificated. 15.9, approval of a new job description. And 15.10, affiliation agreement. Uh, do I have a second? Mrs. Winters, any questions? I, I have a question on 15.9, the new job description. Um, I'm curious who is currently doing this responsibilities. Would this person be the li liaison between the busing companies and the district? And then finally, does the district have the technology or the software to support this position? I would have to defer to who can answer that because I don't want to breach any confidentiality. Um, so this is a, we're actually um, creating this new position, but it's it's not an additional position where we are revising a current position um, into this new position. And yes, we have we have a program we, call, we use called iBusBoss. Okay. Um, currently, we have typically four people in the transportation department. We're down to three right now. Um, and we only have one person that can route. And so as we're looking at changes upcoming with busing and, and things of that nature, um, we really need a additional person that can provide that those services. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, Mrs. Sugar. Okay, the online voting is open. If you have any no or abstention votes, please let me know. We have a unanimous yes vote. Okay, hey, we move on to policy legislation. Mrs. Fleischer, could you kindly move the PL agenda? Sure, thank you. Um, the superintendent recommends, and I move the following 16.1, approval of harassment, intimidation, bullying, investigation decisions. 16.2, second reading of policy 8110, attendance areas revised. Um, and do I have a second, Mrs. Stern? And are there any questions? Mr. Mayor. Not, not not a question, really just seeking um, clarification from uh, board solicitor. There have been some um, discussions publicly about my potential of having a conflict of interest because I happen to live in the Barclay community and my children attended uh, Russell Knight several years ago. Um, my understanding of the conflict rules is that I absolutely do not have one and I'm, I may vote. I just wanted to run that by um, board solicitor to get a second opinion. Uh, since my conflict possibility has been questioned publicly, I thought I would seek that opinion publicly as well. Certainly, uh, the uh, 
there are a variety of factors that provide why this would not be a conflict. The most important is that the School Ethics Commission has recognized that uh, assuming there was a personal involvement, which you actually do not have right now because your children no longer attend, but um, where there is a personal involvement uh, of children of a board member, um, if we were to consistently apply a disqualifying principle, then every board member would in many circumstances be unable to vote on very important matters affecting the children of the district. Um, so there's a recognized exception um, where it really has to be a very specialized and, and very strong involvement that would rise to the level of disqualification. Um, and the mere fact of residency in the particular zone where the school is located in and of itself would not be a disqualifying interest. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Are there any further questions? Seeing none, um, then Mrs. Uh, Sugars, can you please open the voting? Okay, the voting is open. If you have a no or abstention vote, please let me know. Mrs. Stratton. Ms. Sugars, I need to abstain from 16.1, please. Okay, Mrs. Tong has also abstained on both items. Other than that, we have a uh, unanimous yes vote. Okay, and that brings us to strategic planning, which I believe we have nothing to vote on for tonight. So, <laughs> but don't get too comfortable with that, Dr. Rude, because eventually we'll start to have things <laughs> to vote on. Okay. Um, all right, and that moves us along to new business. Uh, board members, is there any new business? Okay. And um, oh, Mrs. Tong. Uh, yes, I just want to, um, I'm not sure if that's new or something, but I think it was, had to do with the uh, last year. I think some committee members raised about the, um, was it um, holiday or Christmas or spring, winter music or what is it called? Winter break? No, there's a music, like children coming for the concerts. Uh, I think some parents expressed the interest in having the, um, to come into the winter concert. Maybe we should think about that um, if it's uh, necessary or whatever is what the, our community wants. I think it's a good time to open up the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Tong. I don't know if anybody has anything related to that or any other new business. Okay, so we'll note that Mrs. Tong has, has a new business topic that you've raised. Okay, uh, and then we move on to any old business, uh, Dr. Brood. Uh, it's old only because Dr. Malosh brought it up a few minutes ago, but uh, <laughs> as I was as I was uh, sitting here um, uh, thinking about the many hours I'll be sitting here, there was a very bright spot in my evening. I love to go hiking and routinely will stop for many minutes at a time to uh, view a nice fluttering butterfly. And when I looked over, took me half the meeting to see it. But when I looked over and saw the butterfly there with the little feet, I was, uh, it was definitely a moment of joy. And, and so congratulations to, to the district for, uh, their butterfly campaign and, um, and, uh, thank you to the children over at Malbert for uh, an awesome craft. Made my night. Butterflies, dragonflies, all kinds of good, beautiful things from nature in the room tonight. Thank you. Okay. Any other uh, old business? Ms. Elmer Stratton. Um, is, I don't know if it's appropriate to, to discuss. So, Mr. Green, are, are we allowed to make a comment on the things we just voted, something we just voted on, the re redistricting or no? Yeah, you can. I mean, typically comments are made during discussion on the resolution, but certainly you can make a comment at this time. Sure. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I echo. Uh, so what current Elmer Stratton, Municipality Cherry Hill. <laughs> I just want to um, echo what Mrs. McCargo chimed in on this evening and that this is not the first time that uh, a board has had to make these decisions concerning the schools. 
And we can go into a long history of the systematic racism that which it was created on with the lines being defined the way they are. However, we're going backwards to move forwards. There was three schools at one time, the sending schools that we just voted on or that are in that policy that will, I guess, make final if this wasn't final. Uh, this is the schools that as it was set up years ago. And so uh, perhaps we can learn from it um, that we can make some changes and turn the tide just a bit over time. However, none of us created what is already systematically in place. But what we're doing is creating a space that we have to move forward on. We got rid of the lottery. And so there was another step that needed to be taken. So, um, you know, I, I guess I always feel like I, I'm sitting here and probably only Dr. Malash can give us better history because he knows everything about this district from A to Z. But just to share that this is nothing new and this is not something that the next board probably won't have to do again. Um, they closed once and reopened. They'll reopen and close again, and this is how it goes. But if we want to get into topics of equity and all of those other things, this has nothing to do with it at this moment. It has to do with us making room for something that we already made a decision on, whether we made it quickly or not. So that's just my thoughts. Thank you, Ms. Amherstran. Any other old business from board members? Okay, uh, Mrs. Gallagher. This is an old business, but I just wanted to, um, this is piggybacking off of Mrs. Tong. I thought we were going to have a discussion, but I just wanted to say I agree with what she's saying regarding um, allowing parents to come to winter concerts. So if that can ever be brought up in discussion, uh, well, it should be. I think um, the parents would like to be a part of their children's winter concert. And um, I think not allowing them is um, kind of unfair. So thank you. So um, for just for board clarification, so we would um, bring items like that if you any board member has, and this is something that's a, a little bit of a, um, a process that we've been highlighting more recently, um, but any board members who have items that are significant or, you know, that you want for discussion, um, we channel those into our committee meetings. Um, so please approach your committee chairs. So in this case, uh, I believe that would likely go under CNI. and i um, and, uh, which would be Mrs. Winters. Yet another thing for your plate. Um, I don't want to get bored or anything over on CNI. No, no. It's a, I don't know how many, what did you say? You spent four or five hours on, on Friday alone doing board business. Um, so carve, carve out more time in your day because <laughs> it's not going to slow down. I'll let you know what my hourly rate is. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Mayor. Free, 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 and free, Mr. Mayor. I think you said you calculated twenty-five hours last week. I don't. I I won't even count how many hours it takes us because it's it's. But anyway, uh, I digress. Um. So the labor of love, you know, perfectly fine. And meeting number two, I I think it's <laughs> I think it's okay. We give you a little grace on that one. <laughs> um. But yeah. But please uh, do you know Mrs. Tong, um, Mrs. Gallagher, anybody, any topic that you have that's relevant that's significant for the board to address to please. You know, please do channel it um, and uh, to your to the committee chairs and um, we'll deal with it accordingly. So, thank you. All right. Uh, any old, oh, any more old business? Because if not, we may have uh, community members who would like to speak or people in just in general in the audience. So, uh, I think we will now um, move on to our second public comment. Um, and I I know you hear this often, but I'll just say it again. Uh, the second public comment is a time when you may comment on any topic uh, for the public. Um, if you'd like to speak now, please clearly state your name and municipality. We will alternate between speakers in the room and those who are online. Uh, each speaker will be given a maximum of three minutes, minutes to speak, and the timer on the screen will indicate that. Uh, Cherry Hill is a community that values education, and educational topics often bring out a passionate response. The Cherry Hill Board of Education supports a school climate in which our diversity is a source of strength and all are included. Respect is foundational in how uh, you treat us, how we treat you and treat one another, and how we support our administration and staff in their essential work. Please join us in practicing the utmost respect for all. And with that, I will go to the room first, as is our uh, typical uh, custom. And so we have our first speaker. Amanda Greenstein, Cherry Hill. I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I don't think I've ever been so angry and 
frustrated and disappointment. You all sat here. You all unanimously voted. I will say, Joel, thank you for at least talking to the solicitor. I wish Gina would have done the same since you do have skin in this game with children. You should be ashamed of yourself. But not one of you represents a Kingston student, a Kilmer student, a Barden student, or a Payne student. So when you read your directions, Miriam, about how we are all matter, it's a lie because you, you, none of you thought about the impact this is going to have on the West Side students. I hope you're happy when your kids are in an overcrowded school, Gina. Madam President, uh, may I clarify something? Yes, Mr. Uh, I was very clear when I spoke that uh, I was referring both to Mr. Meyer's situation and also to a situation where if there were actually children in the school, it would not be a conflict of interest. Thank you, Mr. Green. Me. Okay. And we will go on to the first hand that is raised um, and online, and that is for Chair Hill's own PTA. Janet Hung, Cherry Hill. Good evening, my name is Janet Hung and I'm the chair of the Z Cherry Hill Zone PTA. On behalf of the Cherry Hill Zone PTA Executive Board and the Zone PTA in its entirety, we recognize the services of each of you, the Cherry Hill Public Schools Board of Education members. The Zone PTA and Zone PTA Executive Board recognizes the commitment you have to our students while working with parents, teachers, and school administrators for the betterment of public education. We remain so grateful for all that you do. To show a small token of Zone's appreciation for your tireless work and dedication to Cherry Hill Public Schools, we are making a donation to the Cherry Hill Education Foundation in honor of the Cherry Hill Board of Education to, bo to mark School Board Recognition Month in New Jersey. We celebrate each of you. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. And normally wouldn't comment on public comment, but that was very kind of you to, <laughs> to make a donation, especially um, for the whole point of why we're here, which is the students. So thank you. And we move on to the room. Rick Short, Cherry Hill. Um, today I sent an email to uh, to you all, to the board, did not send it to the district because it's not really a district question. It's a board question and it has to do with finances. It has to do with a number, $500,000 in question. So you all saw the email. My question is, is what number do we have that gets you concerned? What if I said I could save a dollar on 3,000 doors and save $3,000? What if I said I could save $10 on each door, not having them fire rated and we could save 30,000. What if I said I could save $900,000 on 300 doors if we took $300 off each door getting them fire rated when we don't have to get them fire rated? Does $900,000 matter to you? Does $500,000 matter to you? What number matters to you? There's mistakes on this bond. They're not going to go away until they're fixed or somebody says is that they take this money and they're going to redirect. You can deny all you want. You can say that the stadium parking lot uh, is going to get paved and then say that you're going to use capital reserve funds when you have it in the bond. And then to top it off, you put it at the wrong place. You did the work, the architects designed it at the wrong place. Now I'm gonna move over to my other, uh, my friend, Dr. Rude, who's working on going green. I'm, I'm with you, I'm with you. Um, first off, are we gonna to have to make sure that the 10 roofs have are, are white so they're cool? I, I ask that every time. Second question is this, uh, the only real true things that are gonna matter, um, you know, we can, I, I've been studying it. I, I've been studying going green for schools. Um, the only real big thing is, 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 can you push solar panels through? Can that money be reinvested in, in, um, in, um, in, in, in infrastructure? That would, that, that would be an awesome thing if you could put, if you could have that Dr. Root. And finally, it's a, it's a crazy idea, but if you actually think about it, it would make sense. Uh, we could be the premier green school in America, we could be the first one to do this. 
uh, why do we have our lights on from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m.? Really, why? We have motion detectors out there at every camera. Um, we're spending, uh, it, it's tough to say, it's, it's 60 or $120,000 a year on electric. So if we really want to go green, we could be the first school in America to have motion censored uh, light in the parking lot, just like you do at night when you walk through the uh, uh, the uh, hallways. So uh, I sent an email to the police and I'll be back on that information. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Short. And we will go to the line to... Um, I think you're on ERs, you have lowered your hand. Um, so uh, raise your hand and unmute. There you go. Sorry about that. <laughs> Technical difficulty. Uh, Dr. Yoni Aris, Cherry Hill. I just want to ask the board. Uh, my children came out in person. We had to leave, so they obviously go to bed because tomorrow is a school day. Uh, if it is possible, I know this was discussed in the last board term, is that when students come out like this, especially when there's a media agenda, if we could please do a student-only public comment, especially tonight when you had the student board reps go home early before my children had a chance to address the board along with their friend. Um, I know this definitely deterred other students from speaking out who all shared similar feelings. Um, so just something moving ahead, if that could be rediscussed or reevaluated on an as needed basis. Uh, I also wanted to quickly touch about assessments and also that grade school rankings were discussed by several speakers tonight. Uh, there are several research reports out there that show that those rankings have increasingly penalized students with high socioeconomic differences along with degrading schools who have a high number of black and Hispanic students. Um, so always tread carefully when it comes to rankings. Moving on to assessments, uh, a couple of times there has been comparisons historically made in Cherry Hill between the high schools, which I just think is unfair. Um, there's almost a time where there are two Cherry Hills just based on how uh, Ms. Elmer Stratton had talked about it. We are living with the nightmare created years ago with the how Cherry Hill was created. Um, and I think it's just super important that we note that and that when we talk about each school that we talk about their year over year results and that what success they're doing upon themselves and that we don't get into what we're told not to do as parents of comparing our children against each other. And as a parent of six of them, I try to do my best at this. And I think it's a school district where we have 19 unique schools. It's really important to value each of them individually and what goes on because each of them have their own unique environment um, that is done. I am grateful that the district did move forward with a new redistricting plan of four and four and four. And it also got me wondering if it is possible for us to create sibling schools that could enable less islanding of our schools, uh, potentially also to allow collaboration between principals. And it'd be really cool now that we know where all the elementary schools are going to enable fourth and fifth graders to get to meet ahead of time and start building relationships and getting to that one Cherry Hill. Um, and on that note, I think everyone should take a look at what Susan Nicolazzo Dollarton was wearing on the deck at the meet yesterday. That shirt should be reproduced and sold by the district as a fundraiser. It was awesome. Uh, I want to just give credit to what she has done in her transfer over to West and just has really been a rock star and a great example of why we have amazing educators in Cherry Hill. Thank you. Thank you. We come back to the room. If anyone would like to speak at the podium. Okay. Uh, we have four hands up on, at, on the line so far. So we'll go to the first hand. Um, I believe, I believe it's Dr. Pato. It's his phone number. Um, it's 489, that number. Your turn. My name is Jeff Potterwitz, and I live in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. This is from Face the Nation Correspondence Roundtable, uh, December 25th, 2002. Question by Margaret Brennan. What is the most un undercovered but should have been covered story? This is the answer from Catherine Herridge. I'm sorry. Um, so most important to me, though, and I speak as someone for full transparency who has a child who needs special education. He had a transplant. He had development, has, was developmentally delayed. The policies for special education children with COVID had just been crushing. You look at the levels of literacy, math, and you look at middle school, high school, and they slid back to elementary school. And our family is fortunate to have that ability to use resources to get our son to a full-time special education school now. But so many of the children that he was in the public school system with don't have those resources. And I really believe children are resilient, but I have come out of these two years questioning whether these children 
have the access to the tools that their families also need to help bridge that gap. And I really question the course it has sent them on them on in the future. I did some research, and when you look at rates of incarceration, there are incredibly high rates of adults who have learning disabilities or had special education needs. So I think understanding what, ha- what happened to these children and how we can do m- more to support them to try and close that gap is something that's been extremely underreported. Remember that that total between IEP and 504s is approximately 25% of our school district. So school board administrators, where is this on your to-do list? And what have you done in the past years and are going to do moving forward? Also, a school board member made a comment concerning students meeting their potentials. Okay. Given what I just read, how and who determines what these students potential is given what I just read and how they've been really hurt, um, as is all students, but these, uh, thank you very much. I'm done. Thank you. Okay. We go back to the room. If anyone would like to speak, please approach the podium. Okay, I'm just going to keep going, and we can always come back to you uh, if you change your mind. Uh, we'll go to the line, uh, Carolina Bevid. Hi, Carolina Bevid, Cherry Hill. Um, I can't help but notice that as technology use has increased with one-to-one laptops for all students, including in elementary school since the pandemic, that ELA performance has decreased, as we just saw on the Start Strong test results. I'd like to again strongly recommend an emphasis on handwriting in elementary school so that kids can solidify those crucial reading and writing skills before they use a computer as a writing tool. Handwriting a word is very different than typing a word because handwriting makes a mind-body connection that computers can't. Forming the shape of a letter imprints that on your brain much differently than pushing a button. Um, Next, I'd like to be really clear with the board because this was mentioned in the Start Strong results as like an intervention. My children, our children don't need social emotional support from school for the most part, maybe in very specific instances, but they do need academic support. Schools are for academics. Mental health support services can be handled by mental health experts and facilities and schools should keep an eye on that and make recommendations to families but I wouldn't want mental health professionals teaching my kids academics. I don't want my academic facilities dealing with my children's mental health. And it's not helping as much as I think we think it is. Finally, I think that our community is owed an apology. Virtual learning was never a good idea and would never have been implement, uh, should never have been implemented. And the negative effects will continue to ripple out across our children's entire lifetime. And I find it, you know, it does warrant an apology that our schools were virtual for so long. Thank you. Okay, come back to the room. If there's any public comment in the room. Don't see any at the moment. So we'll go back to the line to Ann Einhorn, you're next. Ann Einhorn, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. So first I'd like to thank Justin from the Coles Alternative High School. He did a phenomenal job. And I'm so pleased that our that high school is being represented. Um, I want to talk about the budget for a minute and the presentation. Um, A board member mentioned that we need to be cognizant of the taxpayers. Well, I can tell you that for the last two budgets, including this year, the taxes are only raised 0.49% and 1.25%. And I believe that in the budget process this year, your hands will be tied as to what can be done and can't be done. If an elementary school that is Title I, like Kingston, doesn't have a math coach daily, who fills in the gap, referring to the presentation at the beginning of your meeting? I would like to vehemently protest the change of the BNF committee meetings to 4.30 during the budget process moving forward. Though it may be a board committee, the lack of consideration for the working public does not help the issue of transparency. We are interested, we don't have to speak, we would like to hear it for ourselves. I would like to speak 
on the much talked about policy tonight. I truly believe it will eventually create a brain drain. And even though it was stated that this is not a new problem, it is a new problem in this day and age, particularly post COVID. And currently I am begging you to reopen the elementary redistricting um, in the township of Cherry Hill, the schools of Barton, Carusi and West will be grossly affected with enrollment at Cherry Hill Park, which is under construction, Park Lane Apartments, Garden State Park Place and Hampton Road will be in construction this year. What are we going to do? If you don't have enough money in the budget to support the Title I schools, especially in any other school on the West Side, what are we going to do to ensure that these schools have the personnel and the monies to help our kids succeed? I really feel that this board and perhaps succeeding have created more of a chasm in this town. It, and it's a shame because sometimes the words that have been used um, create that chasm. And the third thing I'd like to no, know, well, whatever. The last thing I'd like to say, forgive me, you ran for the Board of Education. There's going to be many hours. This is nothing. We had meetings till midnight and one o'clock. We didn't have the virtue of the fact of electronic um, help. So I, forgive me, I, I really don't want to hear how much time you spent. Um, a lot of us have spent a lot of times. A lot of us have spent a lot of times in the public without having a public name. Thank you. Okay, and now we go back to the room. Any public comment in the room? Okay, doesn't look like we do. We'll go to the line to Penina Mintz. Uh, Penina Mintz, Dr. Penina Mintz, it's Sherry Hill. Uh, I'd like to address test scores uh, in this comment. Uh, I'd like to address the board and the superintendent. When are you going to be transparent with the Cherry Hill public, parents, and students? If you look at the uh, usnews.com data as far as school districts and performance with regards to percentage of math proficiency and reading proficiency, uh, and you look at the numbers of each and every one of the elementary schools, the middle schools, and the high schools in Cherry Hill, those numbers are alarming. Have you had a chance to look at those numbers and ask questions? How on earth one in two students throughout the Cherry Hill School Districts are not proficient in math? How on earth one in three students in Cherry Hill School Districts are not proficient in reading? When are you going to share the data with the parents and taxpayers of this town and please answer the question what's so difficult to teach basic math what's so difficult to teach basic reading are you telling me that the cherry hill kids are stupid that they can't have no math or reading this is a major failure of the school districts, and I don't know what smoke and mirrors and SEL and the character education and DI and all those wonderful words that you're throwing at us. This is smoke and mirrors. You are not doing your job. Teach math. Any person in Cherry Hill, every student should be proficient in math. Every student should be proficient in reading. This is unacceptable. You have to hold the superintendent and every principal in Cherry Hill accountable for the miseducation of our kids. This is enough. Stop doing all these shenanigans. Focus on academic education, please. Thank you. Okay, we come back to the room. I don't see anybody in the room at the podium. And we will go to the line to uh, Jessica Simpkins. Hi, I've sat through a number of um, general board meetings and committee meetings over the past few months, and there's been discussion around um, some uh, overcrowding, some uh, limited space for one grade versus another for families who have multi-grade students in the same building, and um, the general redistricting. And one of the things that's been discussed was not wanting to bus students longer distances. 
another aspect was <clears throat> the cost of transporting those students. While I value those concerns, they are not being considered for our special education students. Apologies. Um, one of the reasons I didn't want to raise my hand earlier was because I know I get very passionate about this topic, but our special education students are bused across town without a choice because there isn't a place for them in their home school. There isn't a place for them close to their home school. And those students have additional needs outside of school programming. They have outpatient therapies they need. They have regular medical educational needs outside of their everyday school programming, but have to get fit in with those longer distances they are traveling. It limits the ability to do that. I just, I urge the board and the administration to remember these students in the decisions they are making to take into consideration those extra things that they experience on an everyday basis that are not related to a typically developing student. I will tell you, my child having an extra 30 minute bus ride is huge as a five-year-old who has to fit in a number of outpatient services every day. It's not a big, it's not as big of an issue to a typically developing student who doesn't have to fit that in. So just please, in all of your decisions, keep those students in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, going back to the room, do we have anybody else who would like to make a public comment in the room? Okay. Um, and I don't see any public, any hands raised online, um, but I do see a hand from one of our board members. So uh, we should close public comment at this time. And uh, I'm gonna uh, acknowledge Mrs. Fleischer. Thank you. I promise this will be fast, but I think we forgot to congratulate Mrs. Wilson on a amazing um, award that she just got for $10,000. It was out in 14.7 from the Horace Mann Foundation. Um, and I just thought that was something that we needed to congratulate her on because $10,000 for this district is a huge award. So congratulations, Mrs. Wilson. Thank you. And congrats to Horace Mann. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, so we'll move on to superintendent's comments. Uh, so Dr. Malash. Thank you, Ms. Stern. Uh, I, first, I want to start by thanking the students who spoke this evening um, for taking the opportunity to get up and, and speak to the board. That's a lot. It's a lot for adults uh, to be willing to speak in front of the board. Uh, so I'm grateful to, for the children to get up and to, to share their perspective. Um, as Ms. Stern said earlier, um, I'm sad to see Dr. Hogan go as well. Um, you know, we, we have spent quite a bit of time when we hired Dr. Hogan last spring, um, you know, to start in July, we expected him to be here for the next 10 years, uh, which was his expectation too. Um, you know, unfortunately life happens to all of us and, um, you know, folks have to make the, the best choice for themselves and for their families. And that's not an easy, uh, decision. Um, so we will enjoy and continue to enjoy Dr. Hogan, um, until he finishes up on March the 3rd. And we know that he has left an impression and will leave a legacy on the Kilmer community. Kilmer has experienced a, a number of principals uh, over the last few years, um, you know, and, and throw in that, and we've heard additional discussions, whether it's the testing results or other things about the impact of the pandemic, um, you know, those kind of it exacerbated those things. Uh, we posted for an interim position today. Uh, Dr. Mahan and, and Ms. Adrian and I are working on that. Um, it's our great desire and hope that we have somebody to be board approved on February the 14th, which is our work session in February, so that they'll be here to transition with Dr. Hogan uh, before that time uh, begins. And we are looking at all the possible options for what that looks like. We will then post for the permanent position uh, and expect somebody to be here uh, for July the 1st. Um, we will take into consideration all of those aspects and the things that the kids talked about. 
Dr. Mahan still has all the information from when we did the search last year. Um, and we want somebody that will make a, a positive impact. Um, unfortunately, the, the reality of the world sometimes um, you know, ha has an effect. So um, we will go through that. And as there is more information to update to the board and the community, uh, we will absolutely um, share that piece. Um, there will continue to be discussion uh, about the, the sending schools for the three middle schools. Uh, it has been since 1984, since we had um, uh, three neighborhood schools. Uh, and even then when we had neighborhood schools, the alignment for those schools was not necessarily that full elementary schools went to full middle schools. There were a lot of, of items that went into consideration when the board um, began in their discussions in, in the spring of 2021, their charges were very clear to the district and uh, to the committees that worked on redistricting, beginning with the middle schools uh, and then moving on to the to the elementary schools. Um, the information has has been very straightforward, has been presented you know, as it has been available. Um, and we will continue to look into monitor about what takes place. Um, these are not new discussions, Ms. Summer Stratton, you, you did bring it up. It's, you know, I, I've lived in Cherry Hill since 1977. You know, we moved here in March of 77 from Detroit. Um, I've lived within three blocks of the same spot, which is about four blocks from here, uh, you know, where we're sitting tonight since that time. Uh, Cherry Hill is a different place in 2023 than it was in, in, in 1977, for sure. It's a better place. It's a more complex place. It's a much more diverse place than it ever was at that time, um, which is, is a very positive thing for our community. There have been debates and discussions. There have been arguments and fights um, through the course of those 46 years about where kids will attend school. Um, you know, I, re I remember as an elementary school child in, in fifth grade, um, the fights and being on, and when there were people on the news about whether Malberg was going to be closed or whether Kingston was going to be closed, which most of you who are around know that they are literally two and a half blocks apart, these two elementary schools. There was a huge fight about whether Malberg should be closed or, or whether Kingston should be closed. Those debates have continued to rage on, rage on. The district made decisions. At that time, there were 23 schools in the district, um, 23 schools, right? The high schools were graduating classes of 1,000 children in the late 1970s, and then the, the population plummeted. Um, the district sold off schools you know, out on 561 where, where um, Brookfield Academy is, is a school where Mrs. Sugars attended as an elementary student in Cherry Hill uh, back in the day. That's right. <laughs> at, you know, out, out on Church Road, which is one of the Yale, Yale schools, that was a Cherry Hill school. If you go down Chapel Avenue and cross over Route 38, People's Pizza's on the right-hand side. There's the, the Dunkin' Donuts. There's an Arista retirement home. That was Hinchman Elementary School. Of all the schools that have been closed, I so wish that we owned Hinchman Elementary School. You know, that determination and that decision back in the early 1980s has affected that whole section, Still Park, the Barlow section of Cherry Hill, everything on that, that west side of Cherry Hill where there is not another school that exists. That impacts, right? That in, impacts what enrollment looks like. There is always going to be a difference among the middle schools and among the elementary schools in terms of what it looks like. We are never going to have schools that are going to be identical mirrored images unless we move children every single year. That's not real. That's not practical. That's not healthy to go through. So we start with a snapshot in time about where children attend, what that looks like, and then we start to project out. We have projections for three and four years from now. Is that what those schools will look like? No, right? Because kids are going to move in, kids are going to move out, families are going to change. That's the reality of what takes place. Um, so there'll continue to be adjustments, right? There, there, it's just, you know, and, 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 Selmer Stratton talked about, you know, just the reality of where the neighborhoods are. I could not be prouder to have lived in Kingston for 46 years, right? To have gone to Kingston, to have gone to Brainerd, which is now Carusi and High School West, or the fact that I raised my four children who went to Kingston, to Carusi, and to High School West, right? It's one of the, the great highlights of my life to be able to, to do that. There is great emotion and there's great tie that goes into these schools, and I think as we have these discussions, we need to be able to step back from the emotion. We need to take a look at what the practical reality is and what the benefits of the opportunities that our children will have at each one of the schools. We have an identical curriculum at our three middle schools. It's identical. We have an identical curriculum at our two high schools. The curriculum is identical, 
We have children who graduate from our high schools who go to the Ivy League schools and who go to Camden County College and to um, uh, Burlington County College. And it's a spread that is across. That's the reality of it. And I couldn't be prouder of either of the high schools and the work that goes on. Because you know what's the best part of Cherry Hill, the most important part of the school district, are the teachers, the staff members that we have on a daily basis who are interacting with our children and our families. And our children, regardless of the school that they're in, get the best of our teachers every single day. Some children have different opportunities before they arrive at the schoolhouse door in the morning. Some schools have, some children have different challenges when they exit our schools and they go home in the evening. That's real. That's our world right now. There are socioeconomic impacts that have hit so many of our families over the course of the last decade. That's real. Rather than talking about trying to blow out one candle so another one burns brightly, or to try to think that you know one school is going to be worse or is going to be better, let's talk about the children and the families that are there. And I say this every time, every year to board members. One of my favorite parts of the year is going to graduation. I love graduations. I do. I enjoy the middle school graduations. I absolutely love high school graduations. The culmination of the experience. But you know what you hear at our graduations every year is the incredible pride that our children have at Carusi at Beck, at Rosa, at High School East, at High School West, talking about the experiences they have and the opportunities that they have moving forward and what that means to them. That will continue. Again, the best part of what we have are the two things we just talked about, the staff members and the students. We all need to remember that. And we need to do that as a community coming together to make sure that we are providing for the children who are in our buildings, not the children who we think should be there, not the children who we think we want to be there, but the children who are there. That's who for whom we work every single day. Um, somebody else brought it up. And, and again, congratulations to the board. January, as we talked about earlier in the month, is uh, School Board Recognition Month in, in uh, New Jersey. Um, don't know that there's a whole lot else. Doesn't really fit underneath those umbrellas. I think that's it, Ms. Stern. Thank you, Dr. Malash. Okay. Uh, the board will now meet in closed session to discuss confidential human resource matters. It is expected that the matters dis and student matters. All right. Well, we got to add that to the to the to the little thing here. Because you know. <laughs> right. That's right. I thank you. All right. By meeting three, I'm going to get this right. Uh, it is expected that the matters discussed in closed session shall be made public as soon as the need for confidentiality no longer exists. I make a motion to convene to executive session. Do I have a second? Uh, I'll take uh, Ms. T Mrs. Tong. <laughs> uh, all in favor, if you could just raise your hand. Okay, and motion carries. Uh, and uh, we, we five-minute recess, please. Thank you.